Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Stark. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Pastor. Here. Mayor Stanton. Uh, I'm here. Uh, we have an interpreter with us today, Ms. Torres. Please introduce yourself for the audience. Buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita servicios de español, se les pueden proporcionar audífonos atrás. Gracias. Thank you so much. Now is the time for up to 15 minutes of citizen comments. Citizens can provide testimony to the City Council on any non-agendized uh, items. The Council cannot respond in any substantive way because it would be a violation of the open meeting law. Uh, if there are, there are numerous cards here, so uh, anyone who is not able to give their citizen comments now will have the opportunity to do so at the end of regular business before the City Council. Our first speaker, under uh, citizen comments is Zin Hua, followed by Gail Palmer. Can I hand this to the council members? Up to three Thank minutes. You. Great to see you. My name is Xin Hua. I came to Phoenix 27 years ago and have been working as a research scientist at Arizona State University. Now I'm retired. Today, at this moment, I just want to tell you that I don't understand why the City Planning and Development Department issued the TN company the permit to let them rem removing the tile roof of the Chinese Cultural Center. First of all, I would like to talk about the 1996 zoning stipulation. Number 13 is to protect the right of the Property Owners Association, which was formed by the, for the purpose of defining and implementing the responsibilities for the maintenance of the infrastructure, infrastructure open space, and the public amenities. Within the same cultural, uh, cultural center, not only the TN a property owner, but also is the Sichuan Palace restaurant. I wonder if the city planning department ever got the agreement from the Sichuan restaurant before they issued a permit to say TN. Now my question is, why the city government only takes the TN's right into their consideration but totally ignore the right of Sichuan restaurant just because they are minority Chinese business? What a double standard you are. Stipulation 15 states that any request to amend the stipulation must be brought back to the Planning Commission for public hearing. So the, planning, the city planning department issued the permit to the TN company on October 31st, 2017, without any public he hearing. Now, my question is, does this violate the ordinance of the zoning stipulations? Stipulation 11, the property owner shall, shall participate in the public art Pro program for the project in co coordinate with the Commission on the Art of the City of Phoenix. Over the past 20 years, the Chinese Cultural Center has indeed to make these significant art pieces, gardens, and the community square open to the public. Any questions on the on new owner's part to unilaterally modify the public art program will violate stipulation 11. Now, my question is, did the city planning department request the TN company to follow the requirement of these stipulations? Secondary, I would like to talk about the Arizona Proposition 207. 207 requires the government to reimburse landowners when regulations resulted in a decrease in the property's value. The TN company is using the Proposition 207 to threaten the city government 
as they attempted to bypass a public hearing. Now I have the following two questions. First, have the Phoenix City government- Ma'am, I'm gonna, at the end of the two questions, I'm gonna ask you to sit down only because there are many other speakers and you've gone well over three minutes and we do have your written testimony. Okay, the, the, can you let me continue? I said after the two questions, I was gonna let you, but there is more I see, but it's all written down. Oh, we appreciate okay, it very okay. Much. Thank you. Uh, the first question is, uh, have the Phoenix city government ever even tried to preserve the CCC, which caused the TN property value decrease? Second, did the, does the value of TN property really decrease? And the last, but the, not the least, our Chinese community are serious to purchase back our treasure. Why we therefore urge the TN company to contact the Chinese United Association of Great Phoenix directly, not through the media, not lie to the public. Please sit down at the negotiation table for face to face and sell the property. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for that. We have the rest of your written testimony. Maybe our city attorney, we can't discuss substantially, but maybe you have the opportunity to, to uh, speak with uh, Ms. Hua uh, after the meeting and talk about some of the legal issues that uh, went into the decision of the uh, Planning and Zoning Department. Thank you so much. All right, next would be Gail Palmer. Great yes. to see you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Gail Palmer. I've got a sad heart. I would like it to be brought to the attention of Everybody in the city of Phoenix, we lost one of our giants a week ago last Monday, Bev Harvey Koenig. There's a lot of you that probably has, haven't heard about it, but they are going to have a memorial service for her. Uh, December the 2nd, 2017, and the address is 3710 West Orangewood. It's at the CCC Church, and it begins at 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, she was a giant. She worked for the city, I believe, for over 10 years, and I met her about 25 years ago. She's been one of the best activists that I've run onto, and a very dedicated, hardworking lady. Uh, we're going to all miss her. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Palmer, for. Uh, making sure that not only the members of the council, but now the public has that information. Uh, I did get an email on the services. So I'll make sure that uh, all the council members have the opportunity to get that in their email inboxes. And Bev was a great, great community uh, leader and improved the city, uh, and she will be greatly missed. Next, will, uh, next speaker will be Mr. Rusnick, John Rusnick. And then after Mr. Rusnick will be Miss Diane Barker. Hello, my name is John Rusnick. I want to talk to Sal, the CCO. Sal, I want to bring this right to you. You keep telling me that, that my property has, we're just talking about the size of rock. That's where you're wrong. They come down there and they put, started to uh, put the driveway in and they put the uh, Marlow on or uh, Gorilla Snot. He didn't want to buy all the Gorilla Snot. It was too expensive. So he didn't do it. Then they come and put the one-inch rock in. It was illegal. So then neighborhood services come in and made him take it out two years ago. And you're still talking about it now. It happened two years ago. So now they got some gravel in there that is probably all right, but they did not put any Merlot or Gorilla Snot on top of that. They supposedly got some variance or something. Let me read to you what it says here. The city manager or designee may grant a minor variance to this ordinance. That's 39. Uh, 36, when there exists an unusual or unreasonable hardship. This guy owns 17 properties. There's no hardship there. 
resulting in the literal interpretation of this ordinance provided that method of work or repair offered conforms, conforms to the intent of this ordinance. That ain't happening. Nothing's happening. The, the land that I'm talking about is non-dust proof. It's 6,000 feet and 3,000 feet. It's supposed to be dust proof. They done nothing to it. It's the same as it was 20 years ago, probably. It's supposed to be dust proof, and I expect something to come up to happen to this property to make it dust proof because the Air Act that is federal, it says in there that you're supposed to be dust proof and no cars to be transporting up and down or up back into the garage or parking in the area. So this is that rock deal that you're talking about, you talked about three times, it's full of crap. And so the only thing it did, you could say about what I got to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Rusnick. Three minutes are up. We have more speakers. I'm we appreciate finished. it very much. Great I'm to finished. see you. I would, I would like to know if he... Well, he can't Scott. respond. He can't substantially oh, respond. I can respond back to... Well, the I can something respond to back once they use oh, my name legally. Uh, not, uh, only if it's a derogatory term. You can't respond okay. substantially on the issue, but maybe uh, our city clerk could get the information Mr. Rusnick has in his hand and get the councilman to CCO and he can respond uh, uh, otherwise. Thank you, Ms. Barker. Your Gravel next. size. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> good afternoon, Mayor, Council, staff, public. I'm Diane Barker. I'm in District 7. And what did we do on Monday? We got out. We came downtown Phoenix and we had a great turnout not only on Monday but the proceeding for the third birthday of Meet Me Downtown. Now I'm here to say hey we're bringing out people and last night I attended the Phoenix Downtown Neighborhood Association to listen not only to the streets department presentation on uh, what's happening in transit but also uh, what's happening from Dan Glockney and how many apartments some condos but the people what we're tripling the number of people living downtown so today I get on my email as I do occasionally more times than what I'd like, an alert for pollution out of the Buckeye Monitor that's pretty near here. It is only going to get worse, people. Thank you for the people that came downtown that did ride share. The light rail comes by there. I know a couple people do even uh, bus down and they stay later, you know, to go back, you know, with a friend like this, but I'm asking that you take this in consideration. Every day when you get up, you have a decision whether you will be what we call part of the solution when it comes to air, because after all, that's something we all need, we all share in, and we want to help most of us, thank God, so our children and our seniors, the most vulnerable of the population, have some air to breathe. That is more important than having you come and not be responsible for your own pollution. So that's what I wanted to share. And quickly, I'd like to let the uh, city manager know I have, through your request, I have followed up email. And also the value of the program of the um, Cabaton for self-defense, and I look forward to hearing from the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Barker, we have time for one more before we move on to regular business of the council. Purple Fire. Oh, uh, please go around. I apologize, that's a little awkward, but uh, we make do as we got. So, All right, uh, just state your name for the record and then up to three minutes of testimony. Good to see you. Hi. Yeah, good afternoon, Mayor and the City Council members. Uh, my name is uh, just Purple Fire, okay? Purple Fire, okay. Uh, first of all, I love United States. Why? Because once I did a smoky bad job, 
smoky bear from the government, United States government. Those are all I designed for the uh, United States kids since 2006, 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10, I did smoky bear, all of this stuff. This is why today I come to here talking about a little bit smoky bear, because smoky bear, all items licensed from the United States government. And uh, I did this job, it was me, 2005 or six. And then, why I love Smokey Bear? Because Smokey Bear, everything is so cute. I designed almost 155 items for the kids' school, Smokey Bear kids uh, on the school. This is 2011 items, Smokey Bear. These are all I did. This is why I love United States. And then why I living here? A uh, few years ago, I live in Sedona. I moved to the Phoenix because Phoenix Chinese Culture Center, because Sedona do not have, did not have a Chinese food and a Chinese market there. So I moved to the here. And then um, what reason today I talking about Chinese Culture Center? Even I never been to school learn English. All learn English by myself. Okay, I I try do my best because I love United States. I decide stay here. United States very freedom, freedom country. And everything is I have opportunity standing here, talk to mayor and the your city councils. In China, impossible because China law, you know, you know that. And then um, I want to tell, now I want to speak a little bit about karma. I really believe karma. 1988 to 1990, China President right now Xi Jinping, he was my hometown, uh, she, he was my hometown uh, party, how called, like hometown leader, he was in my hometown leader. His office, my homework only three minutes. And he was like excellent, excellent, excellent. Like I said, he did, he made a wonderful, great, my, my city very, very good, okay? He made my city, an economy, everything is grew up. So we are very grateful about him. And so this made him, right now he's very excellent uh, present in China, okay? So this is why I, I was lucky in Hong Tao who Xi Jinping there. Now my, my Hong Tao from Fujian province, Ningde City, N-I-N-G-D-E. Ningde City was very poor, small town. Ms. Fire, we have to si, yeah, wrap si, up all because we have a lot yeah, of si, busy agenda. Yeah, Xi Jinping there. So we are now in economy very grew up. There are so many American engineer there. Thank you. About 20,000 American for your engineer there. Thank so you for I want to say, Please, anything. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think we have to move on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fire. Okay, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, next on the agenda, the city clerk will read the 24 hour paragraph. The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6373 and 6379 through 6383, S44037 through 44071, and resolutions number 21590 through 21595. Thank you so much. Now we'll have a approval of meeting minutes from past meetings. Councilman Waring, have you a chance to review the formal meeting minutes, September 6, 2017? Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Councilwoman Williams, you have a chance to review the formal meeting minutes, September 20th, 2017. I did and move with their approval. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, how about, uh, we have a motion as it relates to mayor's board and commission nominations. Motion to approve mayor's boards and commission nominations. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? 
That passes unanimously. City Council Board and Commission nominations. Motion to approve City Council Boards and Commission nominations. There's a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. It appears that there are numerous citizens here uh, to be sworn in for their service on various boards and commissions. So I'll come uh, to my right, your left, and we'll swear in these uh, citizens, uh, and, and then they'll come behind the dais, and we'll thank them in advance for their service to the people of Phoenix. Please raise your right hand. I state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of, and fill them. according to the best of my ability. So help me God. You're official. Thanks for your service. So please just walk behind me. Just sort of All right, we'll continue on uh, moving forward with our agenda. Next on the agenda are the liquor license applications. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion on the liquor license applications? Motion to approve items 5 through 22, except item 21 and 22. We have a motion. We have a second. Are there any cards on those items? Or at least not in opposition? No cards at all, OK. Um, any comments or questions from members of our council? All, uh, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item 21. Item 21 is um, Deep Roofs Brewing in District 7. I'll hand it over to Councilman Alikowski. How do you want to handle the case? Um, Mayor, I have some questions for Denise. Please. All right. Denise, I was just wondering um, what type of uses would a multi, uh, a microbrewery license allow you to do? Mayor, members of the council, my name is Denise Archibald with the city clerk department and with me is Jessica Breedlove from the prosecutor's office. Councilman Nowakowski, the this application is for a microbrewery. A microbrewery can sell their produced manufactured beer on site for on site consumption and for off site consumption. They can sell and deliver manufactured beer to licensed wholesalers and they can serve manufactured beer for sampling. 
and they must manufacture no less than 5,000 gallons and no more than 6,200,000 gallons per calendar year. In this particular case, this microbrewery also has established in their questionnaire that they're requesting outdoor alcohol consumption and um, for their use as well. So basically they can serve alcohol and sell alcohol on the premise, right? Correct. Okay. And then um, I'm not sure, Mayor, if we have the applicant here. Uh, the, there is one card. It is the owner of Deep Roots. You want to have him uh, come forward at this time? Absolutely. Mr. Uh, Stephen Eldridge. And I don't know if you want to hear his testimony and then ask questions or just go ahead and ask questions. Mr. Eldridge, why don't you provide any testimony you have for this council up to two minutes? and then the council member may have questions for you, please. Okay, um, I, uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council for your consideration. Um, it's been a long process trying to get this uh, location uh, locked in. We looked at this property over a year ago. We've been through use permits, uh, variants for parking, um, talked to all the local neighborhood associations, uh, cash shelter, we understand that we are going to be liable for any customer that comes into our place getting to their car safely, all the things that are probably running through your head about this particular location. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that with that falling back on us, if I have something, you know, an incident with a, a patron that comes in and has, has an altercation going to their car, I'm not going to be successful in my business. And um, I understand that. And it only takes one police report or something negative happening before it scares my customers away. Um, to give you kind of an update to, uh, to what the lady said, we are actually planning on doing a production facility to begin with, which will be closed doors, uh, production only in the beginning. We permitted it to have a tasting room eventually. Um, we're partnering with a bar in the Roosevelt District who's going to sell our beer exclusively uh, in the beginning. And then hopefully once light rail comes in and some changes happen in the area, we can open that location for a tasting room as well, and we have a private patio out back, which is what she was referencing for outdoor alcohol consumption. Um, that's, uh, that's really all I have. If you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Elders. Councilman, do you have any questions for him? Oh, absolutely. So we received some letters of support. You know, we have the um, mayor right. of Glendale, a uh, council member from Glendale, also the Madison School District, um, uh, individual that is on the governing board and also a person from the Oakland Neighborhood Association of right. Support. But we also have gotten calls and a letters of support um, against it, opposing it, from the um, CAS um, shelter, from um, the Human Service um, Campus, um, St. Vincent de Paul, and the Andre House. Those four individuals that we've received calls, those are actually stakeholders that live within walking distance from your facility. The other individuals are from other, other cities and quite a ways away, except for the Oakland neighborhood, which is probably about a mile away. So my concern is that you have individuals that are stakeholders that are trying to clean up that neighborhood. We're trying to really come up with a solution and, and services and shelter and permanent housing for homeless individuals, the city of Phoenix has even invested in a program called um, you know, our, our Phoenix Cares program. And right now we're in that process of really cleaning up and, and looking for solutions and services and resources. And I really hesitate to see uh, a brewery that eventually can actually serve alcohol in that area and with individuals that are homeless right now in that area and it's I don't think it's the right time or the right place the big concern I have is the parking um, you've been working on this project for you said about six to eight months and have you found a parking solution yet we actually got approved for our variance for parking by the Board of Adjustment they reduced our parking down to the six spaces we have on frontage so is it on your property or out in are on the city street or? It's uh, just public on, on the street in front and around our property. So basically it's on street parking, right? Correct. Okay. So that's another concern that I have is that I'm not sure if you ever, I mean, you probably have 
driven in that area at nighttime and to have individuals going out there there's a safety concern that I have as a council member representing that area so these are just some of the concerns that I have and it's and it's really hard for me to I think the business concept is a great concept I think it's something that we need here in the city of Phoenix especially in this Roosevelt and the downtown area I mean it's it's a happening place um, but I think this location right now isn't the right place to actually have a liquor license. I believe we have enough liquor licenses for the community surrounding that area. And to actually grant one, I would, I would really think that it's, it's not the right timing and it wouldn't, it wouldn't serve our community in its best efforts. The other thing is the letters of support from those foreign stakeholders that are actually just right next to your facility it doesn't seem like they've really had conversations with you. Um, who did you actually speak to at the app? Well, uh, Councilman, I only got contact from your office yesterday and I was, I'm in the middle of doing a build out on another spot. Right. Uh, I did have letters of support, uh, Harlan HVAC, which is directly next door. Uh, one of the other property owners who's two buildings down, um, uh, Dane, he doesn't have a business in it, but he owns the building. Um, Bill Moreland, who owns the electric supply company. Um, Reba's Kitchens, which is going in on Jackson. Um, I mean, we've, we've circled back with all these people now. St. Vincent DePaul, yeah, I, I did not talk to St. Vincent, I can tell you that. Andre um, House? Uh, I didn't talk to Andre House. The only people I talk to as far as homeless services are concerned is Cass. And uh, if I could speak to, you know, you talking about the property in the area, the building that we're looking at occupying has been vacant for over 40 years. And that said, um, I, I, and I, I know you said you're, you're looking to clean up the area. If there's anything in my demeanor or in, in the paper in front of you that says that I want to dirty up the area and serve homeless people alcohol, that is not what I'm intending to do. I want to be part of change. The letters you got were from people that we, we use beer for nonprofits. We donate beer for uh, all kinds of 501c3 organizations. Um, all, all kinds. So for us, Soldier's Best Friend out in the West Valley, we've, we've supported Glendale Rotary Club, Anthem Rotary Club. Um, we we want to use beer for a, a positive effect. Uh, it, it really hits a, a place in my heart. And I've, the people that I have talked to, uh, Shannon DeBasic from the Capital Mall Association, which is our closest neighborhood association, uh, I've, I've expressed this. I've attended their, their meetings. Um, they expressed concern in the beginning, and I tried to come back and just tell them who I am genuinely. And, um, you know, I, I haven't gotten any negative feedback, but I did not talk to Andre House. I would be happy to sit down and talk to them. Um, if you want to grant my use for uh, production only with close to public, I'm fine with that too. But um, I've got my whole life tied up in this. I sold my house, I sold my car. I don't, I don't have financing, I'm not a multimillionaire. Um, I'm just trying to do this with, you know, trying to stretch a penny into a nickel here, and uh, the faster I can get it going, the better. So, yeah. thank you very um, much, uh, Ms. Archibald. Well, how, how's the timing on this? Uh, do we have to make a decision today? Mayor, members of the council, the 60 day deadline is actually um, the 17th of this month. Therefore, if the applicant decides or allows the council for a continuance by signing a request for more time, we can continue it. Otherwise, Staff would not recommend continuing it without the applicant's consent. And Mayor, Mayor, oh, Mayor just, Councilman, please. just for information only, um, we actually called the the applicant yesterday to ask him if we can actually continue it, so he can actually meet with some of these stakeholders and try to come up with a solution. Um, I guess your response was no, right? Yes, and I, I wasn't aware that what what the concerns were. And when your council assistant called me back today, um, she only asked me a couple vague questions and say that there were other. Why you wanted the continuance, I didn't know. I just, I'm already paying rent on the building and you know, just trying to expedite this as much as possible. Sir. Yes. Vice Mayor. Um, may I suggest, and it's a suggestion, that uh, we have the ability or you have the ability to continue it. Um, I'm suggesting that uh, the possibility of continuing it and uh, working with those stakeholders around the area, around the property, in order to um, understand their concerns and uh, possibly come to uh, a compromise or understanding. Uh, that's a suggestion. 
Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. That's exactly. Okay, so, so the, the council, the vice mayor has asked whether or not you'd be willing to accept a continuance. You'd have to agree to it on the record. So that way the state liquor uh, board process wouldn't continue to give you a chance to better do outreach to those uh, neighbors who obviously are very active organizations within the city of Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, as, as long as I can get a list and, and have some guidance, uh, I, I didn't understand before okay. today that, that that was the case. So, okay, no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, definitely. Uh, and I would yeah. love to actually set that meeting up for you and, okay. and connect you to those individuals, yeah. All okay, right. so uh, what, what does he need on the record relative to the, um, uh, from the applicant in order to do the continuance? Mayor, we will hand him a form now to continue it. Will it be to the next meeting or further? Okay, uh, it's up to uh, Vice Mayor and Councilman Nowakowski. How, how long do you want to continue it for? If we could continue two weeks so we have enough time to. Okay, so the request is for two week continuance. The applicant has indicated that he would be willing to sign the uh, paperwork and would like the list. Obviously, a starting point would be those that have submitted letters in opposition, but council member who represents the district will probably give you others that he'd recommend you reach out to as well. And we're glad you're here. And wanting to do a business city of Phoenix and we're going to work hard to see if we can't work this out. Okay. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Oh, Councilman Waring, please. You had a question. So the motion, what, what, the motion, let's officially get it on the record for the motion to continue. The motion is to continue item 21. I'll second that. To uh, November 29th. For two weeks. Councilman Waring, please. So, so I, I thought the applicant, they don't always, I know that'll shock everybody. This applicant I thought presented what he had to say and what he's trying to do extremely well. I don't know if everybody would agree with that, but, but I certainly thought um, he made a good case. I understand because I've had relatives who have done it, who put everything into restaurants and so forth, and I understand that you're already paying rent and everything, you're already out of pocket every couple weeks. I guess my, my first question, possibly my last to Denise, we are not the deciding body, the state is. On Councilman Waring, yes, so, that's correct. So does this by continuance, by definition, I don't know what their schedule is. So does this by definition put him two weeks out with the state or could they still do, I mean, when's the next meeting then that he would be on? You understand I think what I'm asking. Is it really delaying him or not? Councilman Waring, yes. Basically, if we continue it two more weeks, it would only have impact him by potentially another two more weeks. Once the council decides, with the state. With the, once the council decides, then the state takes 15 days typically or less, and then we'll issue the license if they decide to approve it. Did I, did I miss something? Maybe I did. That, that the issue was the serving of alcohol, not the making of it. Is that kind of the, the crux of it? I mean, you're nodding, so it sounds like it is. Did you say in there somewhere that you would be okay if we let you brew but not serve? Yes, that's correct. Um, I mean, I guess you have to decide, you're the business owner, do I want to delay two weeks and possibly get the ability to serve or do I want to move forward now? Assuming people yeah. are like, you know, because I, I, nobody ever commented on that and I d thought maybe it kind of right. slid we by. We looked into that and maybe oh. Denise can address a stipulation of Okay, so there's some other complications right. and that's why it didn't yeah, can we? Uh, is that something we can do, Ms. Archibald? Yeah. Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Waring, Councilman Nowakowski, that is not something we cannot stipulate on, a, on the privileges that they are uh, given by the license type. Okay. Yeah, we looked into that. Okay, so the motion is to continue for two weeks. There's a second. Any other additional comments or questions? I have Councilman. a comment. Uh, Phoenix Cares, I think we should really look at um, the mayor of Glendale and, our, and here's a council member also that wants to maybe support our casts and our um, homeless programs out there and financially so um, maybe we should look into that the budget okay uh, <laughs> duly noted um, all right motion for continuance and a second all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed passes unanimously thank you very much we'll see you in a couple weeks sir all right thank you. thank you all right next on the agenda is item number 22 Item number 22 is a, um, it's in Councilwoman Gallego's district, AMVETS post 86. What, how do you like the to post has withdrawn their uh, application at the State Liquor Board, so I move <coughs> that we withdraw this item from consideration. Second. Motion to withdraw, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes uh, unanimously. Um, Okay, Vice Mayor, do we have an omnibus motion on ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning? Uh, 
Uh, yes. Uh, motion to approve items 23 through 93, except the following items 27, 35, 38, 39, 45 through 47, 86 through 88, and 90 through 93. Item 43 has been withdrawn. Items 44 and 89 have been continued to November 29, 2017, and excluding these items for public comment. 27, 35, 38, 39, 42, 50, 52, 54, 74, 79, 80, 81, and 90 through 93. That's the omnibus motion. Is there a second? Are there any comments or questions relative to the proposed omnibus for today? Okay. Uh, and there is a speaker on Logan Elra for 89. Just let you know that is being proposed for a continuance uh, for today. Okay. That would be wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All in favor of the proposed omnibus say aye. Aye. Oh, roll call. I'm sorry. I apologize. Roll call vote. To CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, yes. So that item passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda. Oh, excuse me. Mayor. Is there a motion to take items out of order? Vice Mayor. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and take the following items out of order in this order. 35, 91, 93, 90. There's a motion and a second to take those items out of order and advance them in the agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, so the first item of those is item number uh, 35. Item number 35 is a request by myself, Councilwoman Williams and Councilwoman uh, Stark to put an item on today's ag agenda that would propose to hire outside legal counsel for representation against opioid manufacturers and uh, distributors. Um, and so uh, I maybe the first thing is we'll have a few words from Councilwoman Williams and then see if there's a motion a second and then we'll take testimony on that. Councilwoman. Um, no, I think everybody on this council agrees that it is a horrendous problem that's affecting our neighborhoods, it affects our employees, uh, it is dangerous uh, to the individuals that are participating as well as anyone who has to deal with them. I think it's extremely important that we continue uh, to pursue this. However, I want to be careful that we're not unnecessarily causing uh, taxpayer expense. So I, I have a motion that we first request the city attorney's office to produce a demand letter outlining the basis of our claim and the cost associated that the city has dealing with this crisis and present this letter to the manufacturers as the first step. If that fails uh, for a res positive response for them, then I want them to proceed uh, with their, our original uh, request that you hire outside attorneys if necessary uh, to pursue this action. Okay, so that is the uh, the motion. So the motion would be then proceed first with demand letter, and then if uh, that is unsuccessful, to pursue this proposed litigation, obviously using outside counsel, which would be a, clearly on a contingency fee basis, so not at no out of pocket expenses from. Uh, the uh, the city of Phoenix. So that is the motion. There has been a second on that uh, motion. Uh, I'll now turn it over to members of the public that wish to provide testimony on that proposed course of action relative to uh, actions to uh, against uh, the opioid manufacturers and distributors. How about <coughs> Leonard Clark? Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. I really like your liberal thinking and working with Governor Ducey because you're on the same sheet of music the governor's taking taking charge here and I agree that we need to do something I'm just a little bit mystified that you know we could be also I mean we're afraid to take litigation against bum stocks and all these other things I mean it's great I think it's great that you're really partnering up with Governor Ducey Mayor Stanton because you know, it seems like politics makes strange bedfellows, but in this case, it's not politics. So I congratulate you. I think we do need 
to stop this. It's a horrible thing, and I, and I just uh, stand in wonderment at your great partnership with Governor Ducey, Mayor Stanton. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. Kathleen Santon? No testimony needed, okay, but you're in favor of us moving forward with this action. Mr. Rusnick is also in favor, and Ms. Barker are also in favor, not wishing to uh, speak. So that's the motion. There is a second. I'll now open it up to any questions or comments by members of our city council on this item. I was going to make a short statement um, uh, on it. I believe that this will be the most important item that this council considers for some time. Because let's face it, the opioid epidemic is a crisis and it is affecting all of us. Almost certainly each and every one of us knows a person, a family that has felt the pain because of addiction. And in recent years, because of addiction to opioids. It wasn't always this way. But opioids have become so prevalent because drug companies lied about the risks associated with these drugs. These drug companies knew the risk and they lie. Those lies have destroyed lives in our community. So I believe we must do something about it. During this crisis, families have paid the biggest price, but taxpayers are also getting stuck with the bill too. It's placed an incredible strain on first responders, on our neighborhoods, on the human services that we offer. It's contributing to the challenges they that we have with people experiencing homelessness. My colleagues, Councilman Williams and Stark and I put this on the agenda because we believe we can recover costs and put those resources towards treating uh, the problem. And I'll certainly be supporting Councilwoman Williams' motion. Any additional comments or questions, members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that motion passes uh, unanimously. So we'll move forward with that action. Thank you so much. Next item on the agenda is item number 91. Item number 91 uh, concerns the disposition of Maryville Baseball Park and a proposed agreement between the City of Phoenix and the Milwaukee uh, Brewers. Uh, Councilman Valenzuela, did you want to put a motion on the table as it relates to 91? Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve the proposed agreement. We have a second. Uh, Jason Stokes, did you provide testimony uh, on this item? And please come forward. Uh, you indicated you're opposed to the proposed agreement. And then we have um, a few individuals not wishing to speak in support. Tyler Barnes uh, with the Milwaukee Brewers, Mr. Bob Quinn, Executive Vice President of the Brewers, and Mr. John Cadis, Representative of the Brewers. Mr. Stokes, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, my name is Jason Stokes. I'm a native of Phoenix, resident of District 2. Uh, I'm also president of Aspatia, representing your supervisory and professional employees. Uh, I'm opposed to this. Uh, so today we're considering uh, outsourcing the uh, Parks Department positions um, at Maryville Park. Within the last several months, we've outsourced the homeless outreach team, we've outsourced um, Section 8 housing, and now we're outsourcing these guys. And um, I imagine you've been told positions will not be lost. Um, what I can tell you for the people that are put in this situation is um, that there's very likely, uh, certainly as we look at the Section 8 housing, uh, going to be demotions involved. So they will not go unemployed unless they choose to accept a demotion. And that's part of our, our process. Depending on what happens with these positions, um, if the positions they were in are eliminated, if they're unique positions, and they take another position, they will be ha have to go through probation in that position. If they fail that probation, they don't have a position to go back to. Um, there's a lot of risk associated for these employees. In many cases, these employees have worked for you for a very long time with an outstanding work record, and they've done a very good job. And I, want the, I would appreciate if the council would consider those factors as they, as they make their votes today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stokes, for that um, uh, testimony. Mr. City Manager, I don't know if you want to address the issue of uh, employment-related issues if this uh, vote passes today. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. As it relates to Maryvale Baseball Park, I believe we have eight positions, Inger, that are affected. Eight current field positions, that's correct. 
and we have a commitment that each one of those employees, if they would like to continue with the City of Phoenix, will continue in the same position. They will not suffer financially from this um, transfer of responsibility to the Milwaukee Brewers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Mayor, please. Um, I actually was unaware that they would be transferring over to the Mo Milwaukee Brewers. No, I'm sorry, I they, was... they, they would not. They, they will stay okay. employees of the City of Phoenix any of the eight who want to continue as employees of the City of Phoenix oh, then they will have apply. positions with the City they of Phoenix. They could apply for Correct. a position with the Milwaukee Brewers. Other than that, those eight positions will be staying within the city and they will be at the same level, if not possibly higher if they go for a promotion or anything within the city. Correct. Okay. Just want that on record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other additional comments or questions by members of this council? Councilman Valenzuela, did you have something? Yeah, I appreciate Mr. Stokes' comments. You know, I had a, had a uh, conversation and, and the concerns are valid and I'm glad that they were addressed and we have to continue to work with city staff. These are people, these are city employees, public servants, and, uh, and people that, that should be, whose experience should be considered uh, also as we move forward. This is a great model of how a professional sports team can work together with the city uh, to, to extend their stay uh, potentially permanently, which is amazing. Uh, I mean, doing it in a way where, where taxpayers are being protected. And I want to thank the Milwaukee Brewers. I want to thank the City of Phoenix staff uh, for, for working through this. This is something that we should, should celebrate. Again, this is a new model. It's, we're introducing a new model to extend a professional baseball team uh, to help along the Cactus League, which is doing very well, uh, our, our spring training uh, league here. And, and again, doing it in a way where the city is protected, where taxpayers are protected, and this is what a win all the way around looks like. So I'm very excited about this. I'm very happy to be making the motion today and uh, looking forward to the vote. Thanks so much, uh, Councilman. Vice Mayor, do you have a question? Yes, I wanted to know if a representative from uh, the Milwaukee's Brewers here or who's representing them, I have a question for them. All right, what's the question? I'm gonna figure out whether it would be best for Mr. Quinn or for Mr. Barnes. So I was approached by the community and the nonprofit world asking if the Milwaukee <laughs> Brewers would be willing to partner with them on, um, I guess, certain nights. Uh, for example, uh, St. Mary's Food Bank asked if there would be a night where people could donate a can of food uh, as they go to a spring training game. So I said to them I would uh, ask. So I'm asking. Mr. Cadis? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council. My name is John Cadis. I represent the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, Vice Mayor Pastor. <laughs> I really appreciate your, your comment because what I'm probably most proud of my client in this situation is that the Milwaukee Brewers have decided not only to stay in Maryville, but to be part of the community in a dramatic way. As you'll note in the agreement, uh, we are uh, doing multiple uh, different initiatives to support Maryville and would be happy to do that as well. Um, but I want, to, I want to make note of this since I have the opportunity to speak on it, that we're partnering with Maryville High School. And we're creating a learning lounge within the facility itself so that when the Major League play, Baseball players vacate from their morning meetings, the afternoon is for kids in the neighborhood to come and get free tutoring. Uh, we are working with uh, the Phoenix Union School District uh, for kids who have challenges with delinquency. We're working with Parks on programming, the Cool Kids program. We are working with GCU as well to uh, do Habitat for Humanity uh, redevelopment in our area. We're gonna be there for 25 years or more, and we want Maryville to continue to become a great place to be, live, work, and play. Thank you for your commitment. Yes. I thank you so much. Councilman Waring, please. Thank you. So I'm voting no on this issue. I will say, um, as these things go, agreements with professional sports teams for cities, this is actually a pretty good agreement. I will certainly acknowledge that. I just fundamentally don't believe cities should be in the professional sports business. I don't frankly understand why we're in the professional sports business, but it's been going on for a long time. 
Um, we have other core competencies, police, fire, and so forth. I think we should, we should have more focus on that. However, I understand it's nothing against this neighborhood or this team or anything else. The stadium's already there. So I can see both sides of it in this particular instance. I just think like the Sheraton Hotel, like the golf courses, we should be divesting ourselves of these things and, and not have gotten involved in them in the first place. I think the sports leagues would survive if cities weren't pitting themselves against each other and states weren't. I think we'd still have professional sports. Maybe the players would get paid less. Maybe the owners would like less. I don't know. I think there's any other things we could focus on. This deal actually isn't, to Councilman Valenzuela's point, this isn't a bad deal uh, for the city because the Brewers are putting in a lot of money, and I do applaud them for, for stepping up. He's right to say that. So um, this is simply more of a, a fundamental kind of core belief. I, I just can't get past, but again, it's nothing reflective of this particular deal. If you're going to assume that we should be in this business, and there's a benefit, and obviously many people agree with that, we're doing it uh, in a lot of cases, um, then if you go with that assumption, this actually isn't so bad. But, uh, but I just I can't vote for it myself. I just want to make that explanation. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any other comments? Councilman Asisio, please. Well, I think it's important for the public to understand what the deal is and what it is. And I think it's important for them to understand it's an extension of 25 years uh, with the Maryville Stadium. Uh, they put in $41 million of capital up front. We put in $10 million over time. They put in a $1 million per year in capital expense. We don't have any capital expense after this. Uh, we maintain the building already. We maintain the grounds already. That continues forward. So essentially, when it comes down to projects, this is a model that the City of Phoenix needs to look at as we move forward on anything else as well, too, because you have such a large infusion coming in. But it also guarantees the amount of individuals. It's an economic development tool as well. And people coming in, part of the Cactus League, you want the entire Cactus League to survive as well. I agree as in general terms with Councilman Waring when it comes to these types of things. Uh, in this case here, uh, the City of Phoenix essentially maintains everything the way it was anyways. We have to do the maintenance. We just continue forward with the maintenance. The only difference is the brewers now take care of all capital expenses. And then after 25 years, they have an ability to purchase the site at appraised value. Um, I just don't know how much better of a project you can get and still maintain everything the same way. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the work that they did on this thing. And I think Councilman Waring has a very valid point on that thing as we move forward with anything else. And I think we should always have a critical eye, especially when it comes to taxpayer dollars. But in this case here, I think this is a really good uh, proposal that was put together moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Councilman Gagnon, please. Thank you. Right now, the city of Phoenix is in a budget deficit, and we need to be fiscally responsible. There are a lot of things that we want to do, but we have limited resources. Um, this deal, the city would contribute $10 million towards the, the facility out of the sports facility fund. We also need to remember there's some significant litigation now involving the funding source for the sports facilities fund. So at this point right now, I don't think this deal makes sense, and I'm going to be voting no. Thank you very much. Any additional other comments? Mayor? Councilman, please. To Councilman Kate, uh, Gallego's point, though, too, and I think it's very clear that people need to understand these are still taxpayer dollars, whether it comes from the sports facility fund or not, these are still general fund monies. And I think it's important for us to make sure that that's there as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. You're good to come. No, I'm, I'm excited about it, Mayor. Uh, speaking to the core mission of our city and what we need to, to offer, more first responders and so on and so forth, this is how we get there as well. You know, the Cactus League is an economic engine for this valley. And if we say no every time there's an opportunity for an investment to come up, then we can't serve, we can't uh, protect those core values that, that a city stands for. I don't think we can get a, a much better deal than this. In fact, this is the first time we've ever seen it, not just in Arizona, but probably anywhere in the country. So this is an opportunity to extend the Milwaukee Brewers in an area that needs it. We're talking about Maryville and a ballpark that needs it. Think of what $40 million of private investment is going to do, not just for that stadium, but those surrounding neighborhoods. Bringing GCU in for a learning lounge, which is a free tutoring program for kids in Maryville. So it's, it's moving education along as well, working with nonprofits. All of those things happen, happening 
again, with an infusion of private sector funding, $41 million, but up to 60, I believe $64 million of, of uh, private sector funding, just from the brewers, not to say what's following that, to help drive Maryville forward, which then helps the tax base, which then allows us to put more cops on the streets and firefighters and you know, improvements to libraries and the so on, so on and so forth. So I, I am incredibly excited about this. I think it should be celebrated. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting to the vote. Thank you very much. Councilman Nowakowski, please. Mayor, just for the record, um, I was informed that we didn't have to go through the um, sale of the um, parks process that was created when it was about three years ago or so. Um, could you explain that? Ms. Erickson, uh, why is this uh, exempt from the normal disposition of park property policy that this council passed? Uh, Mayor and members of the uh, council, uh, this is um, a special use facility and it is not a, um, it's not a park. Uh, it was originally land that was vacant that the uh, John F. Long uh, family uh, gave to the city and because of that, um, it, it doesn't fall within that jurisdiction. All right, any other final questions? All right, so, uh, Vice Mayor, please. So I just wanted, for uh, the record, you did speak to the family, the John F. Long family regarding it. Because uh, my question was, when somebody donates land, do if they put stipulations on it, we have to follow what uh, that stipulation um, was placed. And so my understanding, it was just donated to the city and now the city is, is moving towards a different direction and they were fine with it. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, yes, we did sit with uh, Jake Long um, and several members from the John F. Long Foundation uh, and they were ecstatic that the brewers were staying. Uh, they also, um, in, in the contract, original contract, after the first year that the spring training was held, uh, the property was free to do what uh, the city wanted to do. I think one of the things we also have to understand is that uh, if the brewers had left, say they were going to leave, that we still have a building that we have to maintain. And uh, at the end of the day, the city will still will, would have to maintain that building at the level that we needed to in order for the MLB or any other team that we would have to go and recruit uh, for that area or we would have to turn around and sell that property. So I think that when um, I hear uh, the city shouldn't be in the sports business or the sports arena, these are decisions that were made previous to us, and we are now in the position that we have to maintain buildings that we own. And so that's kind of the dialogue uh, that happens when uh, we are part of this uh, uh, situation. And so um, I just think it's, it needs to be very clear uh, that in this process, we, we were very clear on making sure that the education community around that area, uh, specifically Maryville or Phoenix Union High School uh, students would have access to education and to tutoring, quality tutoring that is needed within that area in order to rise and move uh, that community forward and be able to have the quality education. And so um, I'm very proud of that, that element and piece. The other dynamic is that in the agreement, my understanding is in 25 years, I think it's 25 years, that we will then have the opportunity, uh, we'll see what we'll, we'll be in the future, then I'm not, I won't be here, but uh, there will be a future and there could be the possibility of that area being landlocked and uh, we would be able to have the ability then to purchase the practice uh, baseball fields. Mayor, Vice Mayor, um, members of the council, that is uh, part of the um, agreement that we've struck. Thank you. Councilman Williams, please. Uh, Mayor, I'm very supportive of this. I think uh, Maryville continues to need this positive influence and the structure of this agreement, I think, really uh, heightens the advantages uh, for the youth in that area. I also think that anybody that doesn't believe spring training is a benefit to this community ought to talk to the hotels, 
to the restaurants, to the car rentals, to the airlines, and to all the shoppers because they bring in millions and millions every spring. Uh, they are very valued commodity and to keep this team here uh, is very, very valuable, uh, not only to Phoenix, but the whole West Valley. So I thank you for all the hard work you put into this and I support this issue. Thank you very much. Council Warren. So to a couple points, um, I, I think I acknowledged, uh, I'll assume some of the comments were directed my way. Uh, I guess I would say this, um, I understand that the stadium's already there and that bulldozing these things isn't easy or simple. I think I acknowledge that. I understand, like I said, the other side. I'm not criticizing anybody for voting yes on this, as I sometimes do. I would not say that <laughs> in this, uh, this case, uh, politely, but you know, every once in a while we disagree. Uh, in this case, though, I understand you've already got the edifice. Now you're left with, well, do we bulldoze it and try to bring something else there? And then, but, but when I got elected, um, several times I heard, we've always done it this way, or we've always done this, or we've always done that, so you can't change. <laughs> then what the heck did I run for office for? <laughs> I think those decisions were bad decisions. We shouldn't have been doing this in the first place. We should have been trying to do something else that's better for our money that would have generated more revenue and brought more police officers and so forth. Um, I don't feel like I'm obligated to continue what I consider was a flawed decision in the first place. Again, nothing against the brewers, this area, or this particular deal, which is good as these things go. It might be the best in the country. They're not wrong about that. Um, but it's still not good enough in my mind to justify it. And I also just philosophically don't feel that this is something we should be doing. I will say I could knock on doors in my area all day long, and there isn't one person who would probably say, yep, Yep, I want to pay for a spring training facility somewhere else. I'm willing to pony up $10 million or $40 million, whatever. We'll each chip in a couple bucks. I won't find anybody who says that. They'll talk about it for, I had it this morning. Inger, we talked about it. Parks in our district. Can I go out and fix the parks in our district? The person asked on my own because the city's not doing it. Well, we're redecorating resources elsewhere and other things. Um, I'm skeptical that this generates revenue that helps the broader tax base, uh, it's just, it's not a big enough deal. So again, it's nothing against the team or anything else. I do understand the comments that were directed my way. Um, maybe it's just me being obstinate, but I do not feel as a representative of the people in my area that I have to go along with stuff that I feel is just a fundamentally flawed strategy. Um, and it's just, it's frustrating to see and if I don't vote no now, I guess nobody ever will. It'll just go on in perpetuity. And then we'll be broke and wonder how we got there. So thank you. I just wanted to respond to that, Mayor. Sorry to take a uh, Don Miguel Reese uh, is part of the four agreements. And one of the four agreements is not to assume. OK, Councilman Olkowski, please. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. I'm one of the um, council members. There's three of us that represent Maryville. And let me tell you that we've been working very hard to revitalize the Maryville area from the Desert Sky Mall to all the amenities that we have in our parks. And this is really a win-win situation for the residents out there in Maryville. I just really want to thank um, council members, uh, Valenzuela and Pastor, and all of our um, staff members that have worked really hard to actually make this possible. I, and once again, I call this that Team Phoenix approach where we come together and, and we make things happen. So once again, thank you so much. I believe it's a win-win for the residents of Maryville the residents for, of the city of Phoenix, and for all those baseball lovers that come to our great state to enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, any other additional comments by members of the council? Okay, we have a motion in favor of the proposed agreement. We have a second. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. No. Nowakowski. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So the motion passes six to two. Next item on the agenda is item number 93. Item number 93 is a consideration of a citizen. I think we're doing, yeah, 93 now. Okay, no problem. Uh, so 93 is a consideration of citizen petition related to uh, group homes. Mr. S so um, this was submitted, I think, two weeks ago. So Mr. Stevenson, maybe give us a short uh, kind of report on this and uh, your recommendation on how we best proceed. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, you'll recall two weeks ago there was a petition submitted that, required, uh, that requested the Council enact a 90-day short-term moratorium for group homes or in the alternate, a framework that would define a time frame when in which a comprehensive ordinance revisions could come forward to the Mayor and Council for them to adopt uh, as we deal with structured sober living homes uh, and other group homes within the City of Phoenix. Uh, the materials that are provided in the agenda has a uh, outline of the framework that staff is proposing as we deal with this group home issue. And so it really rests on, on two pillars uh, moving forward. There's the zoning uh, side of things and zoning changes that we're working on, uh, as well as the license process that is overseen by the city clerk department. And so uh, we continue through both departments along with the neighborhood services department who helps with enforcement on this issue to work with our stakeholder group uh, as we have over the summer and will continue through this fall to address this issue. And so we do have as part of this proposal a um, timelines that have us coming to the full council on December 13th to present an overall group home improvement package, get feedback and input from the council uh, at that point, and then we would be working in January, February, and March to bring all those different elements and their exact ordinance uh, changes that would be needed through the required public hearing process. So for example, on the zoning side, we'd go to the village planning committees in January, the planning commission, then ultimately city council. The clerk staff as part of the license process has to post new fees on the website. And then in addition, we will um, be going through their public hearing process and having meetings uh, as well. All of that culminates in marrying those two things back up so that on March 21st, we could be before the council with a full comprehensive package of changes related to this group home issue. Mayor, I have a question. Councilman Okowski, please. I know that we had this on our e-session um, agenda and time ran out because we had policy and that we were gonna actually listen to it in our following um, e-session. I don't feel comfortable voting on something that I haven't gotten legal advice on. Can we continue a a petition from the uh, public until we get that legal advice? Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Nowakowski, yes, a motion to continue is in order. So at this time, I'd like to have a motion to continue until we get that legal advice we need. Second. All right, there is a motion to continue this item and a second. We will have, in between now and the next council meeting, at least one executive session. Oh, we, I guess we'll have to schedule one then because we're gonna have to we'll have schedule, we're gonna have to schedule them because this is an important issue. and. We just had such a busy uh, executive session <laughs> yesterday, this item was not able to be heard before we got to policy. Mr. City Manager. Mayor, I think there's a couple options. One is you could continue the item to, uh, what, the next executive session is scheduled is December the 5th. The framework that Mr. Stevenson <laughs> has proposed here would not have the first item before a council body until December the 6th, which is the downtown subcommittee. So you could adopt the framework as presented by Mr. Stevenson, which would allow you to have an executive session before the subcommittee had the first step in meeting, or you could continue to the 29th, in which case we would have to schedule a special executive session, or you could continue to the 13th, and we have an executive schedule session scheduled on the 5th. So I think if you want to continue, there's two options. One we would have to schedule an e-session, the other we have one. The other option would be to pass the framework and you already have a, an e-session before the first time the council meets on this subject matter. I think I'd like to have it before the council meets on this subject matter. Mayor, Councilman Okowski, for the, for the <coughs> record, I have talked to uh, the two uh, proponents of the, um, the petition and I think they are both supportive of the framework as presented with some, some other comments and, and the framework does not, uh, it just outlines, here's the steps we're going to go forward and do. We will come back to you in e-session uh, to provide that legal guidance and then subsequently in public hearings uh, before the uh, downtown subcommittee on the 6th and then the 13th for the full council. So there's time for an e-session uh, in between that to discuss exactly what would be in there for you guys to vote on on the 13th. And I would say adopting the framework does not mean you are locking yourself into any a specific position that happens at these different council meetings, the first of which is December the 6th. So the framework is really a schedule to get to decision making. 
So it's a timeline or framework. We want to call it framework. Yes. I'm calling it timeline. timeline. Okay. Correct. Here. Okay, so that is the, the staff's recommended course of action, is which may allow for the executive session or will allow for the executive session in the meantime before the next substantive action as a sort of a way to accomplish both uh, items. Councilman DeCicio, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And just so that I can land and, you know, staff already kind of has, you know, has a pretty good idea of where I stand on this thing. The group home issue is a significant issue throughout the city of Phoenix. Matter of fact, it's significant enough that I think that it needs to be curtailed or found a way immediately and I'm concerned about the speed that we're going on this I understand we have I think one or two more uh, meetings left with the committee um, and I know that there is some effort to try to get us to move toward the Prescott model that did this and I'll explain the problem but just to be very clear I do not believe the Prescott model goes far enough it does not do enough to protect the neighborhoods it does not do enough these are commercial entities right next to people's homes with very little if any regulation on them and there are individuals coming in there. So I've talked to the, the fire department just to give you an idea of how significant this is. Uh, these group homes took over California because they just allowed it to go through and then they started moving over to the city and they started coming over to Arizona. We've been raising this alarm bell for several months now. Councilwoman Williams, myself, Deborah Stark and others have been pushing this agenda hard. Councilman Dolkowski, I think all of us on the council but I am beyond adamant that this needs to be done a lot faster than February or March. Every day we go is by, there's one more business coming in. But when they came in across, over 305 group homes opened up in, this, in the town of Prescott in a year's time. 305. Insane. So we started seeing this happening in the city of Phoenix. We need to start taking the steps. And yes, there will be legal challenges. I'm okay with pushing the legal boundary on this issue. One, I'm just making sure I get my uh, comments out there as we're moving forward with these committees. Second thing is I do believe that we have to do federal legislation. We've already met with David Schweikert's office. He's been fantastic. Councilman Stark and I, saw, um, we met with him, talked to him. He's looking to move some legislation forward at the federal level. From our end of it, we need to push the boundary. We need to get into that uncomfortable stage because if we're not uncomfortable on our end, we've got a, a, an amazing amount of people in the city of Phoenix who are going to be uncomfortable if we don't take action. So what I would like to see is how do we speed up that agenda item faster than March or February of next year to be taking action? This has taken too long for someone like me. I'm a kind of an impatient guy. Maybe it's the Italian thing in me. But either way, but um, I think we need to find a way to speed up this agenda. I'm fine with the continuance that Councilman Nowakowski is going to move forward. It makes a lot of sense to do it all together at one time. But at the same time, we need to find a better way and a faster way to get this thing done in the city. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Councilman DeCicio. Uh, any additional testimony? So the motion that is on the floor is for continuance. Um, you want to change that in light of what, what Alan Stevens, you want to stay with the continuance? Okay, so the motion is to continue to when? Uh, we want to do two weeks and then uh, we'll try to get uh, everyone scheduled to at least uh, get it together for an executive session. We'll have to schedule. We'll do our best. I know people's schedules are busy, but this is an important item. Yeah. Can uh, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio. The motion would, to the 29th would mean that we would identify an executive session time before your meeting next uh, in two weeks. But the executive session, session is on the 5th, correct? Yes. We, that's a scheduled one. We would have to call a special one in order to consider this before you want to do the that? 29th. To do December just do 5th. Just, yeah, December next 5th. week is going right? to be Thanksgiving and mm -hmm. everything else. You would yeah, I think have to do this right. You, so if we've got each session on the 5th, that means the council's on the 6th. Is that correct? You have a... A council fifth. meeting on 13th? December 13th. The 13th. So just move to December 13th then. Okay. I hate to do it that long, but it's better to do it right the first So time. To December 5th, December 13th. That, that would work. Okay. Uh, Councilman Ware. So just for staff, so part of the timing is there's a 60-day waiting period before we could implement, correct? So there's nothing we can do. I mean, it's already, now we're talking December 5th, so that would be early February, because I know that was referenced. I mean, just to be clear, we can't do it any quicker than that, right? 
Mayor Councilman Waring, that is correct. Uh, that's the fastest we can bring it back and, and meet the legal requirements that we have for zoning ordinance process. We have to go to the Village Planning Committees, Planning Commission Council. State law requires any new fee that is enacted, you have to post on your website for 60 days before Council can take any action. So the intent with the framework was to get direction from Council on December 13th exactly what type of license program would you like, what are the elements of that, what would the fee be. We would then post that fee, the clerk's office would go through the requirements that they have to in terms of having stakeholder meetings, working with uh, our stakeholder group to develop the operations manual, those types of things, so that we could then bring all that back for council to take action on in March. So, uh, Vice Mayor. Go so, ahead, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so, so it's not really, a, there's no way to speed it up from what you're saying, if we did it December 5th and December 13th for the actual vote, the earliest would be, I guess, then February 13th or thereabouts, right before it could go into effect. It would be sometime later in, in March, um, would be, uh, and that would, in, or I mean later in February, yeah, because you'd have the 60 day window right. to February, it'd be a little bit later, we'd have to coincide with what those exact dates are, and then there's subcommittee issues too, because they only meet once a month, you go to the subcommittee then, the full council, unless the council just wants to bring it back to, to the full council and bypass the subcommittee. We probably should do that. Just bring it all back. Yeah, rather than. I mean, Vice Mayor, Councilman, that, that, that is one way to consolidate the timeline would be um, to go straight to the full council rather than and we doing a, a subcommittee first. That, and we can that have a, a, a discussion and dialogue at full council versus in a subcommittee. I mean, we have a dialogue and discussion, usually it lands and then we have a minimal, but we can have a dialogue and discussion at the full council and just That's skip correct. the subcommittee. If the council chooses that, yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Mayor, thank you. So, so it may have taken too long to get to this point. I personally wish we could have moved further, but Alan, you and I have talked about this for dozens of hours probably along with our legal team and Chris the other day. Um, it's a big issue in my area, it's a big issue I think in every area from what I've heard from colleagues and just people I know who live in other areas. Uh, so maybe take, have taken too much time to get here, but now that's kind of the fastest schedule to skip the subcommittee, get to late February. Um, for purposes of today, you know, there's uh, still a motion on the table for a continuance. I had concerns yesterday, obviously. I had, I had talked to you guys about this, but you know, obviously might've had more questions in e-session. Sometimes I play off the questions of my colleagues. <laughs> Yes, for better or worse, know. But, but, but you know, you guys ask a question and I ask more questions because I like asking questions. Or hearing myself talk, one of the two. I'll say it because you guys were thinking Both. of it. I see you <laughs> laughing, Kate, thank you. Um, but, uh, but I would say, um, I did, did sort of hope, I don't know the person who brought the uh, petition forward. Obviously, I, I sort of interpret from him bringing the petition and already working on this issue. He's a little frustrated at the time frame. Um, I just hope that somebody notified them that that there was a potential we weren't actually gonna do anything substantive today, and now we're talking about doing a continuance. I just, I feel bad when people come down here and then we continue stuff that we knew we were gonna continue before. So, and I certainly thought this was a possibility. Do you know if any of the representatives are here? I don't really see them, but. Mayor, Council yeah. Waring, they, they are here. Uh, I did talk to but them. But they're okay with it? Is that they're, they're okay with the framework as presented. Okay. I would note, for, for the record, one of the other elements that goes with this is uh, an enhancement to the existing reasonable accommodation process. So one of the things that uh, the TAP neighbors have a lot of concerns about is the existing reasonable accommodation process and that being too lenient. So under the existing ordinance that council passed in June, it provides the, the planning development director the opportunity to make the final decision on a reasonable accommodation. And so what we are working on putting together is a process that would allow for uh, like a three member body to take public comment. We would, as part of reasonable accommodation, notices would go out. We would take some public comment. That group would then make a recommendation to me as the director uh, as we evaluate these reasonable accommodations in the interim. And I believe that step along with this framework is really what provides the, the satisfaction to the TAP group that we're moving back forward in, in the correct direction. So, um, reading up on the next meeting, we have one 1129. Um, then I'm assuming in order to have an e-session on this just one item, um, it would be November 28th. 
if we want to move we we could work to schedule a special e session bef sometime before the formal meeting next okay. of November 29th okay. it could be on the 28th or it could be on even on the 29th in the morning or at noon or something before this meeting okay. we could work to schedule that if that's what the council would would like what i'm hearing from staff and i'm hearing from several colleagues is that uh, we would like to move the framework due to the number of timeline, the 60 days and everything, and, and as soon as we, we create the framework, um, it triggers in the 60 days and, we're, and we can move this faster than later. That's what I am hearing, and I'm hearing it from the colleagues. So can somebody say yes or no, you're way off? <laughs> Mayor, Vice Mayor, you are, you are correct. Okay. So I guess I, I for one, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, whichever <laughs> once you want to grab the microphone, uh, or Devil, I, uh, uh, I, I would, I would like to do the special. It's not too inconvenient for people. I know there's a holiday okay. in there, but I'd like to do the special um, meeting just to discuss this. And okay, so can you look at uh, at I think least we can November get something 28th or 29th on your calendars on the 29th. Okay. Before this meeting, though, you'll have the information before you come to this meeting. Maker, the motion. Are you willing to do that? <coughs> I'm willing to do that. Okay, I'm the second. So, for to get a e session uh, before the November 29th formal. Okay, so the motion is still to continue. Continue to the to 29th. Yes. Understanding we're going to get an executive session for you to get briefed before you have that meeting. Right. That's my understanding. Okay, that is the motion. Uh, there are some cards on this item, and uh, so you heard what the motion was and the rationale for it. So now we have something to testify to. Mr. Wallagram, did you want to testify on the issue of continuance in light of the, uh, the discussion that occurred? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You do want to write testimony? Yes. Please come on down. Up to two minutes. Okay. Whoever wants to speak, please just state your name for the record and, uh, and uh, give the testimony that you wanted to provide. Mayor, members of council, uh, thank you very much. Jeff Spellman from Take Action Phoenix. The whole purpose of submitting the petition was to have this conversation, to engage this conversation at the full council level, and it's happening. We are elated for that. We really are. Um, Councilman Waring, we understand. We are frustrated too. The same thing, this should have moved faster, quicker, and that's why we submitted the petition. We weren't seeing things happen quickly enough. It's in your hands. That way we gave you the option. If you guys want to do some sort of a moratorium to put the brakes on for a while, that's great. It's fine with us. This framework that was put together by the staff, we've been in close conversation with them, certainly does what we ask as an alternate in the petition to do. Um, the city manager, we're grateful for your work and endorsement of this because this is a very complex issue that involves a number of city departments, planning, city clerk, Neighborhood services, the law department, I don't know who all else involved. Very complex, and it needs that kind of high-level direction. So we appreciate that from the council, from the city manager's office, and we're perfectly fine. Either direction that you want to go on that and get your advice, we certainly can wait a couple of weeks to, to, to have your decision on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Frank Danzel, did you wish to speak on this item? Mr. Wallagram, you want to write? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, the reason we do want to uh, comment on this is, uh, as Jeff said, there is a, a large amount of frustration with regard to pace and with regard to some experiences we've had. Uh, we voted for, or we approved the uh, text amendment that was done on June 21st with reservations. And the primary reservation was about the reasonable accommodation process that does not provide any public input, not even taking public information and applying it. We are also concerned about uh, some things that are happening outside of any of our control. For example, on December 4th uh, to 6th, there's a, going to be a conference, a national conference in Scottsdale at the Ganey Ranch Hotel. And the title of the conference is Investing in Addiction. There are people coming from, from around the country because that's, this is about money. 
bottom line. And one of the reasons that we get um, a little bit upset and, and excited about this thing is that we want people with addictions and people who are disabled to be treated. That it is not fair for us to have neighborhoods where people can't be treated fairly. I am a product of the Fair Housing Act, 1967. Um, and I believe that uh, people who are now using the act are in some ways uh, using it not as it was intended to provide safeguards for everyone, but are using it for other reasons. What we would hope that the city will do, no matter whether you vote for a stay or a hold a moratorium, which is a part of our petition, or you move the process faster. What we hope is that um, you will do as uh, Don Miguel Ruiz says, and that is be impeccable in your word. And what we've seen is at times some lack of impeccability. So we, what, whatever decision you make, make it so that the process works for people in neighborhoods, whether they are disabled or they're sim simply residents. If you move this process faster, we think we can protect everyone. So what we're asking you to do is be thoughtful about what the other side of this process, if it doesn't happen, and it doesn't, and we're in June still having these conversations, that does not provide protection for residents of group homes, nor does it provide protection for neighborhoods. So we'll let you all, because you're smarter than we are, some days, <laughs> we'll let you decide what you want to do. What we would hope you would do is no matter how this process goes forward, I hope everybody will be impeccable in their word, because we're going on another faith trip. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Graham, for that testimony and your leadership on this important issue. Is anyone in the audience wishing to speak on the issue of the citizen petition as it relates to group homes at this time? Okay, so the motion was made and it was seconded, knowing that we're gonna add an executive session as soon as possible uh, in advance of the next meeting. All right, oh, Council Marion, please. So just to respond uh, to Mr. Spellman's comments, you know, I, I appreciate frankly, everything he said, um, the spirit in which he brought this forward. I don't blame him for being frustrated, but in fairness to staff, um, uh, you know, Alan, like I said, we've had public meetings about this. You know, Ed and I have fielded questions about this in different forums. It is a complicated issue. I feel bad. Uh, there is a constituent, Vicki, and I'm forgetting her, her last name, that we've <laughs> talked to several times. Um, if you're not a lawyer, it is hard to really understand. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm in that same boat. Um, it takes lawyer to lawyer. I've watched it happen, or expert like Alan plus a lawyer to lawyer. It takes a long time to explain this issue. I agree with Councilman DeCicio. It's not only an issue all around the city, but we need, we need to be, I think, sort of trendsetters in this, because I'm sure this isn't, in fact, I know it's not, but speaking only, obviously, for myself in the city of Phoenix. I, I think this is an issue all around probably the country and it will impact people. If you think you live in such a nice neighborhood, this will never impact you. I can assure you, you are wrong. So this, this, is, uh, this is everywhere um, in all kinds of neighborhoods and I don't know if we have to put a stop to it, we have to make sure the bad actors are, are not acting badly anymore because you can really ruin somebody's life. The stories we've heard are really unpleasant and um, it's just, it's not acceptable. I never had complaints about this a few years ago. It's just proliferating to Mr. Graham's point about people sort of making money on this and it's becoming, I don't wanna say a racket, but, but this proliferation. Um, at some point, if you're sitting in the audience, it's probably gonna affect you or someone that you know. And so we, I think we need to address it, which is why I asked to move as quickly as possible because I think to Mr. Spellman's point, they've been patient and now we need to do something. And if that doesn't work, we'll have to try to figure something else out. But we need to do something expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Waring. Any additional comments? All right, with a motion for the continuance, second with the testimony of Mr. Graham and others, as well as the addition of uh, the executive session. 
All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda. Uh, item number uh, 90, uh, which is a proposed zoning case at the 7th Street and Marlette. We did a very short continuance uh, from our last uh, uh, meeting. Um, under uh, how we typically do our zoning cases is we'll have Alan Stevenson provide a short staff report. I will then open it up for a uh, public hearing and take any testimony. I uh, did, uh, my team has been working with, I think, both sides, and I asked because of the length of the testimony I received last time that we uh, limit each side to 15 minutes. Uh, and so that's, unless someone on this council disagrees with that, we're going to, I think some of the council members, myself included, I have to go coach a youth basketball uh, league. Uh, uh, so I have to, I have a hard stop myself of five. I can get on the phone thereafter, but I have to leave at that time. Um, but we'll, we'll hopefully, uh, people have divided up their time. Um, So at this point, uh, I don't know, Ms. Stevenson, if there's any additional staff report. Oh, we have a hand up. Did you have a hand up? Please, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I've tried to be as, if you follow, you've, you've been a regular uh, leader in this community and you've come to many meetings, you see that I've always tried to uh, give everyone an opportunity to provide testimony, usually ad nauseum, and the meetings often go uh, late as a result. I was asking that, I don't know, is that, I don't know if some of our team had agreed, I thought we had a, a different one, I apologize, but I thought it was 15 minutes. You're suggesting there was a different agreement in place? Yes. Okay, then, I'm, then if that's the case, I trust you and we're gonna go with it. I just may need to physically leave the uh, meeting uh, uh, during it and uh, appear uh, telephonically um, because I don't want someone to feel like they had an agreement and it goes, it goes against uh, uh, what was agreed to by people here at the city. Um, so let's see, we have representation from the applicant, representation from uh, people who happen to be opposed to this case. And I, did we make agreement as who go first? I, don't, I should know this and I apologize. Do we have agreement? Do we have agreement as to who would go first under these circumstances? Okay, Mr. Earl, did you wish to provide testimony for this council? Again, we're gonna, we're gonna time it. You can you have up to 25 minutes, but, uh, but divide it up as you will with you know, yourself and other supporters that you brought here. Again, I'm asking to modify it from a normal uh, uh, circumstances because of the amount of time that, uh, uh, that we had last time. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, for your record, my name is Stephen Earle. Uh, you uh, may have in your possession a report that came out from staff today. Uh, you know, these are additional stipulations that um, you may consider on this case. Um, we have not had a significant period of time to actually analyze those, uh, but um, I'm here to make the presentation. <clears throat> I will comment that I've heard five minutes aside, 15 minutes aside, now 25 minutes aside. Uh, we obviously had a number of people who wanted to be here on this case. Uh, they have made attempts to be at every single hearing, and in this case, that's been four different public hearings that they've made the effort to come down to. And you may remember that it's very difficult to get people that support a case to come down and take their time, um, but they made that effort. Uh, we told them that because we'd had a very lengthy hearing last time, that the mayor and council was not likely to take a significant amount of time this time. So uh, some of them made the effort to come down, but not nearly the numbers that was there before. Uh, at the hearing last time, there were a couple of issues raised that I didn't get the chance to spend very much time on, uh, one of which was traffic safety. And a great deal was said about how this project would produce an unsafe condition uh, along 7th Street. And we had a um, 
professional traffic engineer study the amount of traffic this project would produce over what would normally be allowed under the existing zoning uh, and put it into the 7th Street traffic conditions. We pointed out that there's 31,000 vehicle trips per day on 7th Street, but as we all know, what you really care about is the peak hour, because that's when you're using the road the most, except for the peak hour, most people are able to travel well. So we studied the peak hour as well. Um, and then we were told, uh, you know, what, well, let me back up. Initially, one of the things that uh, was very important when we were negotiating with the adjacent property owners, and even in prior cases that were involved in this same property, everyone was concerned about accessing uh, this property down to Marlett. Because once you reach Marlette, as a local street, you can go eastbound on Marlette and then go throughout the neighborhood street system and network. So one of the major concessions when we started this process eight months ago was to find a way to take out all that access to, Mar uh, to Marlette. Originally, there was an office, uh, actually zone CO, which is now a part of this project. That was gonna access onto Marlette and create a lot of traffic uh, itself than, than the apartments. Whether we were there or not, there was R4 development, so R4 apartments could have been built. And so as we think one of the major concessions right from the beginning of this case was that we we're gonna take all that traffic off Marlette and take it to, to um, 7th Street. Then we were told, well, that won't really work because the traffic during the peak hour is so heavy that your people won't be able to make that left-hand turn going south. They'll only be able to make right-hand turns. So they, they will make right-hand turns and go up to Maryland. And then they'll flow through the neighborhood, which will be even worse, because there's a school there that loads between 745 and 815. Uh, and we said, why would anyone want to get into a 10 or 12 car backup on Maryland uh, just to be able to go that direction? They would save a lot more time just waiting to turn south. But then it was real important to figure out whether that initial conclusion was actually correct. Is it, can you actually turn south uh, with some ease, notwithstanding the enormous traffic that's on the street, even during peak hours, it carries just under 2,000 vehicles. So uh, we actually did, went, sent our traffic engineer back out, uh, and by the way, her report was accepted by the city, we have that letter. Uh, and then uh, she went back out and physically witnessed uh, how this, what we call a gap in the traffic, uh, where she, uh, she, she looked at how many times there was actually a gap because of the two signals, one up at Maryland, just 500 feet away, and one down 1,400 feet away at, uh, or 1,000 feet away uh, at Rose. So it stops the traffic. So once that traffic is stopped, how much, effort, how much effort does it take to make the turn in that gap? And she was able to find that there was a gap virtually every minute to a minute and 10 seconds, depending upon the signalization and that that light was red for through traffic for about 35 to 40 seconds. Well, in that period of time, you can make a lot of turns. But we were told that's bogus, you're wrong. So, because this is notwithstanding the fact that it was a registered engineer uh, and, and it had been accepted by the city, I went out and did it myself. And I timed it with my, uh, with my watch and found exactly the same conditions. I made the turn repeatedly during the peak hours. Uh, so but that's just my personal opinion, and that's no better than anyone else's personal opinion. So we put up a drone in the air, and we, and we actually filmed this intersection for one whole hour. Now we did this on August 15th. The importance of August 15th is that it's two weeks after the Madison School District is back in session. So no matter where you went on vacation in the summertime, as a parent, you have to be back in town for that. And so we wanted to make sure that was correct. Uh, because we were criticized for the original gap study that was on the day that the Madison School District closed. So, you know, theoretically, the last day of school is different. So we did it again, second one. And uh, it was, we've been criticized that it was too close to Labor Day. Well, it was a week and a half away from Labor Day. So we think this is actually a fair drone study. Uh, but I didn't get to show it last week, so um, this week, I am going to show it. Uh, here is the study showing that it was, I'm going to show you one minute of it. I have a whole hour of it. I'm not sure you want to watch the whole hour. Uh, so I've got one minute. 
this, you, just so you know where we're taking this from, we're on Stella, where the project would be. We're looking westbound towards 7th Street. And you can see the commercial on both sides of Stella, which is the street right there in the middle. Uh, and you can see some cars kind of lining up. Those cars actually are people in our office who lined up so that they could make the turn. Uh, and you can see that the traffic on 7th is not significant at this moment. But as soon as I let this thing run, you'll see that it'll get very significant. But you'll, I just want to set this in, 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 uh, up for you. At the, at the um, what, right side of that uh, 7th Street, you'll see the intersection of Maryland. And that has a signal, green or red. And then just off to the south is the Rose Lane which then has a signal as well. So it's very important to know, no, ma no matter how many cars are driving south uh, at peak hour going down 7th Street, if they get stopped, then there is an opening for people to make a turn. If we had a signal, then we'd have to wait for the signal to turn. So here we go. We all get to see the drone together. Um, and you can see that the traffic starts to pick up because the signal has turned uh, green. And it, and it goes by, um, now there's traffic coming up from the south because that has not been stopped. So, but now you see the, the signalization has stopped all the through traffic right there. So the traffic is now going east and west on Maryland. Now, now a car goes out, another car goes by to the going north. There's a car or two. Can you see it's not that significant? Now one more will go out. Now this is, an, and I'm only showing you one minute. So I know this may sound like, seem like five minutes, but it's just one minute. That's the reason we put the counter at the bottom. Uh, there's another car goes out, makes a safe left-hand turn. Uh, we wait for this one car to go by us going right. Then another car goes out, uh, and that car turns right. So that's what we're saying. Now when that light turns red again, or turns green again, now all the cars going south on, on 7th Street start to pick up. Now this, just so, uh, I thought, well, you'll be criticized because that's, you picked a minute before the peak hour of the school. So I decided to show you another one of the 60 minutes, and this is only a 30 second one, but um, this one is at eight o'clock. So this one would be right in the middle of the uh, school loading on, uh, that's on um, Maryland for the traditional school. And so again, you see traffic moving south on 7th Street. Now we see the signal turn red. Uh, and now, so you have the east-west movement on Maryland. Now you can see that gap. <laughs> um, and again, this is only a 30-second clip. So we've only gone 11 seconds, 12 seconds, 15 seconds. Cars are turning left very easily because all that heavy traffic, thousands of cars, is being stopped at Maryland. I think you can see that there are significant gaps. And this is the study that was then done. Uh, the peak hour movements uh, going south, more than 80 cars can make that turn going south. Um, and, and only 20, we, we think more than 20 will go north. There's 100 total cars going, in and, uh, going out. Uh, we think that oh, about 20 or um, about, it's about equal for both uh, north and south. But we said, but even if there was most of them going south, you still have more than enough room. So we think that traffic safety, personally, is just not an issue. Um, we've tried to study this every way but left to make sure that the council knew that the density produces trips, but even if you take the existing zoning and compare it to what we're doing, it doesn't produce significantly higher number of trips, maybe a couple of percent more than would otherwise be there. Now, the next issue that was raised last uh, two weeks ago was this issue of there's no sidewalks in this area and kids are going to end up having to walk on the streets and it's a walkable area. So I went out there personally myself and drove uh, the block that, that this project is in. And you can see it in yellow here. And the green that you see on the map, both sides of Maryland to the north, 7th Street and 10th next to the school, all have sidewalks. They're there today. The green on Marlette is also a sidewalk adjacent to the school, uh, but you can see this area where our project is is red because there is no sidewalk there today. But as you know from, from our prior hearing, we're gonna be putting in a beautiful new 
offset sidewalk that's tree lined on both sides. You can't get a better pedestrian experience than that. And once that red is filled in, the only pieces that it will not be there is the two yellow pieces, about, a about uh, 100 feet or so. And those are parking. Those are asphalt. So they're not parking, excuse me, they're asphalt. So no one has to walk in the street um, in this. And, and if necessary, we would work with the city to have those uh, yellow things uh, turned into uh, sidewalks, because I think there's adequate right of way there. To us, this is very important, because um, all of a sudden, without, uh, even, even though we had notified the Madison School District on four different occasions uh, about our case, the first one we were required to do before, 30 days before we file a case, we have to notify them of the potential children and let them do an analysis. They sent us back uh, the, the form response that said they had adequate uh, school facilities for the children that would come from this project. And then we didn't hear from them again, but we sent them notifications because they're within the notification area to every neighborhood meeting, every public hearing. Didn't hear from them until the day before a Madison School District board meeting a week ago, last Tuesday. And they said, we're taking this uh, matter, your case up on our agenda as an action item to make a recommendation. So I scurried, changed my schedule, got there, uh, to, to present, and I presented them just what you just saw, uh, essentially. I didn't get the drone in, but <laughs> I, I showed them the, the sidewalk, and I, and I showed them the traffic conditions, and I said, we really don't think we're creating an unsafe condition for the children. In fact, we think the opposite. Had this property, you can see it here, been developed the way the zoning would have allowed, which was the original office project and the apartment project, all that traffic would have therefore then gone on Marlette. Some of it would have gone to 7th, but some of it would have gone to 10th and then spread through the neighborhood. So we actually feel we're making the project considerably better than it would have been had it developed under existing zoning. The other part we made, um, didn't say to them, because that was the issue that they needed to hear, is, is the traffic safe and are our kids safe? We felt they were, certainly not caused by our project. If anything, we made it, we felt significantly better. So what, what happened after they took all the testimony, even though it was scheduled for an action, they took no action. Um, so you obviously don't have a letter from them saying they oppose this case. Uh, they, they decided to remain neutral. So this is the project. <clears throat> this fundamentally, and I know you've heard this all before, uh, so I'm gonna try to not take 25 minutes, Mayor. Uh, this uh, is the site plan, and I think one's, one's, what is really significant, I think, about this is two things. One, and we continually say this, and neighbors, the neighbors who are opposed to this want to forget this, but the general plan calls for high-density housing here. Now, it's not as high as they want, but it does allow the density. They want it, I guess, lower. But it allows this, and so the city staff confirmed in your report that we are in compliance with the general plan. The second thing that's important about this photograph is that every single property around this is not single family. It is all either commercial to the west, or office to the north, uh, office to the northeast, or apartments to the east and south. I think that's very significant because that's why we decided to do this here. It's in a beautiful uh, north area of the city. It's along 7th Street, which has seen massive revitalization. Uh, it's, it's a place to be. It's, it's got opportunities for employment in numerous directions. So it seemed like what this area has right today is, and, and, and the point I made last time is that there's a significant demarcation between what's west of 7th over to Central and what's east of 7th over to 12th. In that, what's east of 7th is not homogeneous all single family. What's east of 7th is very diverse uh, area. It has numerous uh, multifamily districts and actual apartment buildings. I counted over 10. Uh, and, and those projects are all, with one or two exceptions, uh, which I'll note for you, they're 30, 40, 50 years old. So they have rents at the lower structure of, of rents in the six to $800 range. What is not in the area is an ultra sophisticated um, millennial type or late baby boomer type project 
that is at a luxury level, luxury level in both in the exterior and on in the interior. So you're bringing in a whole new demographic of people. We've, we've told you about Wood Partners demographics that they have about $100,000 uh, per month uh, as, uh, per month, excuse me, $100,000 per year annual uh, incomes for their uh, tenants, <clears throat> and their rents are in the $1,500 to $3,000 range. So we think this will be an absolutely gorgeous project. But getting back to this, this uh, site plan, we went to every single property owner around this project. It's what the city tells us to do. <laughs> they say, if you want a project to be approved, you need to go to all of your surrounding owners and find out if it's acceptable. Now, because there's no single family around this project, we didn't have to go to a single family owner uh, per se, but we started with this and we said, what can we do to this project to make it work for you? And that's where we started making all the concessions. Um, the neighborhood leaders who are here in opposition and I say, we have been unresponsive and not willing to make concessions. Well, I humbly dis and respectfully disagree. We made significant concessions at the beginning of this. The original proposals for this development were over 270 units. And we designed, what we turned into the city was at 255, and now we've come down to 245 based on the, uh, the input we received. So we have made significant uh, reduction in density, but it's an integrated project. You can see here that you, don't, you can't carve off part of this building uh, and, and drop more density, because all the attributes of the luxury nature of this project are all integrated together. So like, for example, that internalized garage. Uh, not, most projects don't have that. In fact, if you see a class C or B apartment project, they're all asphalt. Maybe they have a little bit of covered parking. This is all internalized, and all of it is directed out to Stella. Then, uh, so that was one of the things that we were told, uh, that you, you, you really need to make it in this fashion. It had this density, and then the second thing we were told is you need to have a buffer of three-story on Marlette, so that what people see as they drive up and down the street is a three-story project. The four-story has to be behind where it's only adjacent to multifam multifamily or commercial, and where it's not seven feet off of 7th Street, as some project could be, an urban style project would be very close to 7th. Well, we're fortunately 200 feet away from 7th Street. So we had significant setbacks, that so we wouldn't be an urban in character. And that's the way this project was designed. The third, so, so we do have that three-story buffer, and then we were told at the hearing two weeks ago it needs to be at 35 feet. It's at, it will be at 35 feet to top of road. The four story has to be only at 45 feet, so we're not talking about five or six or seven stories as probably other urban projects might be. Then we were told you have to have suburban setbacks. I mean, these were things we worked out early in the project. You can't have this thing seven feet off, the, uh, off a Marlette. Uh, we have a project called Alta uh, Camelback that is literally seven to nine feet off of uh, 7th Street, but that's urban in character. Uh, so we did that. We brought it back 20, uh, 25 feet from back of curb, and then they said we want lush landscaping. We don't want this to be austere. We don't want it to be uh, drought tolerant. We want to see turf where you can put in turf. You can't put turf in the, in the right-of-way, so we have lantana in the right-of-way. Uh, ha and then we were told we want the buildings to face us. We want the buildings to face south toward Marlette. We don't want them turned inward, so we see the back end and just... Uh, you know, windows. So that produced this, which we have turned into the city, and we understand as part of the um, additional stipulations now, because we were told by some of those who are opposed to this case that you show us pretty pictures, but you'll build something else. I said, that's absolutely, uh, I do not want to be accused of showing you one thing and then having Wood Partners build another, and they don't want it either. We have a very thick PUD which we spent a lot of time with staff. They kept asking us to put in shawls everywhere. Every design feature had to be a shawl. So they asked for this rendering as well because this rendering is a personification of all those development standards that we put in the PUD. And you can see here that, that every unit that faces Marlette has a door and a patio uh, that steps down with a little area for flowers. I think it's going to be very attractive. You come down your sidewalk, you meet the offset sidewalk, you have trees adjacent to the building and out by the curb, 
and then in the, in the curb area where you can't have turf, you have lantana. Uh, you can see there's an extensive use of brick. That was another one of the concessions that we had to increase the brick uh, to make it more residential in character rather than austere or modern or sophisticated. So we're now up to 50% of that, which means the first two floors are completely brick. Um, and, and, and we were at 40% on, on Stella with additional uh, brick on the other two elevations. Uh, so this is three stories, you can see. Uh, that's very important, and it's set back 25 feet from back of curb. So all that produced um, a project that we're pretty proud of uh, because the PUD ordinance says that it has to be superior. The project has to be superior. Well, the neighbors seem to think that it has to be only, not only superior, but, or the single family folks, but it also has to give something to the community. I, I don't, I'm not sure what that is, because the ordinance doesn't talk about giving a park or, or a statue. It talks about making it a superior project. So in this case, uh, um, just to back up, we removed the access to Marlat so that you could have a total pedestrian experience here. We created lush landscaping. Uh, we have a completely internalized parking garage, as, as we've shown uh, here. Uh, we have the front doors all facing onto Marlat with, with balconies above for the units above. We have luxury level finishes inside and out, obviously more brick than we had before. Uh, and we have that three-story height limit, just to name a few. Last time I had three pages of them, but I, I didn't want to go through all of them. So those are all things that the code does not require. Um, and that's the reason we got such support from all the adjacent owners. Now, those who are here in opposition say that notwithstanding all that support, you're gonna hurt our neighborhood because it's completely out of character. Well, we humbly believe that the character of, of the area east of 7th Street is radically different than the character west because it's much more diverse in the nature of both the housing and in the amount of apartments. And what we don't have there, we have lots of apartments east of 7th, but we don't have this kind. So we believe that we started in the right way. We got the support of all of our adjacent property owners, and then we went one step beyond. We just went out door to door to the people who, who actually lived east of 7th Street. Uh, and I can't say that we encountered absolute 100% support. Uh, there's certainly people that were not happy, but we spent time with every one of them. Uh, whether it was 20 minutes or a half hour, we spent time with each one of them, letting them know about the project so that they would be willing to either send an email to the city or sign a statement of support. What we didn't do is set up an online uh, a, a petition because an online petition obviously can, is, depends upon what information you give as to whether or not some people will react to it. So nothing was said in the online petition about the general plan. Nothing was said about the fact that this matter had gone before hearings in front of the village twice and went to the planning commission were extensive hours of hearings and it was voted overwhelmingly in favor at both uh, levels as well as the staff report in favor. So when you, when you create an online petition, it's all about what input is given. Uh, and then the second part of that online petition is the webmaster, because we set up a test case, um, and we put a support Phoenix up. And then we just threw in bogus information, like uh, we live at 123 Sesame Street, or we have uh, uh, John Bogus is her name. And the webmaster gave us back all of that as, as support. So there was no filter, there was no verification, no accuracy done by the webmaster as to what whether or not those signatures were I think, real. Thank you, Mr. O, for your uh, testimony. We the, used up the entire time, so we need to move on to the other, uh, the other side. Appreciate okay. Appreciate very much. All right, uh, we have uh, many folks here in Washington to speak in opposition to the proposal. Uh, let's see, Mary Crozier, did you want to go first on this one? Or did you have an order? Did you have an order? Whoever wants to go. I do have it. Thank you. Could you leave Mr. Earl's presentation up? I would actually like to use it. And I need a, a clicker. Thank you. Is that a 
find his. Right. Got to find the right one. Oops. I'd like to talk to this slide. My name is John Hathaway. I live, at, uh, I live on Maryland Avenue, about four blocks away from this. And at the last meeting, I introduced myself as a statistician. I, I, do, I do research, statistical research for a living. And I want to talk about this study. Mr. Earl spent a lot of time in that last presentation talking about how great the traffic is. And I want to talk about the statistics associated with this. Now, this is a 420 car garage, 420 cars. Statistical research shows that between 78 and 86 percent of Americans work what we would call a standard day shift type job. They work somewhere in the hours of 7 to 4, 8 to 5, 9 to 5, something like that. 80 percent, oh, basically or more than 80 percent of people. So what we would expect to come out of that garage between the hours of 6 to 9 a.m. is 80 percent of 420 cars. That's 338 cars. Now, Mr. Earl ex said he expects about 80% of those cars coming out of the garage to turn south and 20% to turn north. So 80% of, of uh, 338 is a pretty big number. How many gaps are there? How many vehicles can go out? 99 vehicles. How many, I can't read that turn, 38 turns expected in that hour. That's the peak hour of traffic. What are the other 100 and, or what are the other 300 cars doing? Where are the 300 cars? The real number of cars that we would expect to be coming out of this apartment between the hours of 8.15 and uh, they're 7.15 and 8.15 is about 170. And if you have the ability, and I can't really read that, is that 69? 69. So we got 69, the ability to allow 69 vehicles out into that street, and we got 170 vehicles waiting to turn left. What is the other 100, what's happening to the other 100 cars? Where are they? They're in line. You got 100, by the time you hit 8.15 in the morning, you got 100 cars waiting in line to turn left. This study is trash. It is bogus. And I, and I, I will put my reputation as a statistician online to tell you that that is the case. Now, if we can go back to my presentation. At the last meeting, I brought up an example of, I introduced the concept of what I call a, the nine-foot man. And the nine-foot man is based on the laws of probability. And the idea here is that we have a neighborhood, and that neighborhood has some typical characteristics. The typical characteristic of this neighborhood is that it has an average density of nine units per acre, with a standard deviation of seven. Here it is. got an average of nine units per acre, standard deviation of seven. 65 units is eight standard deviations away from that average. The probability of that occurring is one in 200 billion. And what that really means is that you would have to travel to 200 billion neighborhoods just like this one in order to find one of these buildings. That's what the laws of probability says. That's what that nine foot man is. There is a virtually a one in 200 probability, one in 200 billion probability based on the average and standard deviation of, of men in America. Men in America, the average, if you're interested, the average height of a man in America is five feet, nine and a half inches tall, with a standard deviation of four, just in case you're interested. He's an outlier. And what's significant about him is not his height. It's not how tall he is. It's how different he is from everybody around him. It's not his height, it's the difference between his height and the little people there. But those aren't little people. Those are normal people. 
He just sticks out like a sore thumb. And we can't put a wig and sunglasses and fancy jeans and a brick, bricks and, and balconies and a luxury amenities on him and hide him. He's still there. He still stands out. He's unlike the others, significantly unlike the others. And if we invited him into our home to live, what do we have to do? We got to raise all the doors. We got to raise all the ce ceilings. We have to make physical changes in our home to accommodate him. We are talking about Im impact versus image. Mr. Mr. Earl talks about image. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to be luxurious. It's going to be wonderful. Image is not enough. Impact is what counts. What is the impact of doing this? Well, we saw the, I gotta find my presentation here. That's not mine. Well, my name is John Hathaway. So the, what we're talking about is impact. And the impacts are what changes our community, not what it looks like. I live four blocks away from this. To tell you the truth, I don't care what bricks are there. I don't care how big the trees are. I don't care how it looks. I care about how it impacts our neighborhood. And when we're looking at, so I talked about the, tra uh, the, the, traf uh, the traffic safety. When we look at doubling the density here, every time you double the density, you double the opportunity for bad things to happen. If you double the number of cars, you double the issues associated with traffic. If you double the number of toilets, you double the amount of stuff that's being flushed down the, the sewers. If you double the number of units, you double the number of potential fire safety issues. All of these doublings create consequences. They create impact. And the impact can manifest itself in many ways. Now, this is a Wood Partners project in College Park, Maryland. This burned in April of, of this year, seven months ago. This was a five alarm fire involving 200 firefighters. This was described as the largest fire suppression effort in the history of, of uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. This building was ultimately completely dis demolished except for the concrete parking structure in the middle, like, like this one has. This structure is 200 units bigger than what they're proposing. July 7th, Oakland, California, Wood Partners, Alta Waverly, that's the name of it. 196 units. This is 20% smaller than the building that's being produced. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? Now imagine 400 feet to the right of that is a school called Madison Traditional Academy. 400 feet away, that school is 400 feet away from this structure. Now I talked to the city's lead fire prevention officer last Friday, and he said, quote, every fire department in the country is scared to death of these massive stick-built structures. And he explained that while they're under construction, there is no fire prevention, there is no fire suppression, there is nothing that can prevent one of these fires. If you think about fire safety as an issue here, if you think about how hard it is for, how risky it is for a firefighter to fight this fire, this is what we're concerned about. This is impact, not image. This is what counts. Can you imagine why we, the neighborhoods, are upset with this? Why we are bothered? This is impact. This makes a difference. Bricks don't make a difference. Balconies don't make a difference. Trees don't make a difference. Luxury amenities don't make a difference. This makes a difference. We, vote to, we urge you to vote against this. The responsible thing is to vote against this. This is a reckless decision to move ahead with this project. There are too many risks. There are too many unknowns. There are too many negative impacts to our community to allow this thing to go through. It should never have gotten to this point. Doubling the density is not appropriate. Doubling the density impacts negatively risk in a big way. We do not want this. Thank you.
All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hathaway. I stopped the time in between uh, uh, speakers to make sure it's uh, fair. Who's our next speaker, please, ma'am? Sandy. Hi, I'm, my name is Sandy Gruno. I'm with the Mid-Century Modern Neighborhood Association. I just wanted to, uh, I wasn't sure if she has my slide up yet. In the meantime, in, um, I'd like to hand over to the mayor. This is not bogus. These are, uh, we are up to 975 online petitions together with uh, the petition that was signed at the North Central meeting. So um, there is a filter on there, and that is that you can only have one, you can only input one per email address. Thank you. And I tell you what, we don't have the funds. We don't have the time to do something bogus, Mr. Earl. Okay, we know we're here for the continuance uh, from November 1st. Uh, we, the applicant and the neighbors, were asked by council to work towards a compromise. In good faith, Mary Crozier and I met with Mr. Earl on November 7th in hopes to reach consensus. Compromise, as defined, in the dictionary is a settlement of differences by mutual concessions. As of November 1st, Wood Partners was at 245, it sounds, and as you know, they're still at that right now. Um, and at that point, November 1st, we supported the current zoning at 130 units, rental units. We met with Mr. Earl. We advise that we have now gone up to 170 rental units. That's a 31% increase. We're still at 50% lot coverage and three stories maximum. Mr. Earl would not budge. An additional call was made to Mr. Earl on November 13th, and there is no movement. The time for compromise has come and gone. We asked the council to broker a compromise. Do I just push the green button? See, I'm so technically challenged. Here we go. All right, so that's what I just showed you um, or spoke about. Okay. Conceptual. Prior to the meeting with Mr. Earl, Mary Crozier asked that he provide a copy of his November 1st presentation and have available the construction plans. Portions of his presentation were missing. The construction plans consisted of artist drawings. He could not tell us where the garbage was housed. Mr. Earl then, um, when we asked him about the fire lane, he pointed toward the green line strip, you probably remember to the, the right side of one of the earlier photos, uh, which means the conceptual drawing is inaccurate because that conceptual drawing shows you trees, grass, and so on, and we know that if it's a fire lane, it's not going to be grass, it's going to be cement. Um, so the, um, we're, when we asked him how many apartments, one, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments were planned, and he did not know, he said, because construction plans were not drawn up. Um, I called Adam Sterneri with the city planning, and he sent me the various department's evaluations, which were vague and short with no detail. There are no construction plans. The PUD is a concept. Uh, sh I, I'm surprised, I mean, this is, this is new for me, but the, I was surprised the city um, did not require detailed construction plans before approving at any level, be it the village or the planning commission, and, and here we are before council. Do you know the risks? Uh, the, vo the vulnerable are two primary public schools. We've already had a child hit by a car and reports of other kids that were near misses. Uh, and you heard two weeks ago, one of the board members from Madison said, children at this age uh, in the primary are not devel developmentally, sorry, I can't even say the word, so maybe I'm not either, but they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, get out of the way when a vehicle is coming or something towards, coming towards them, something in movement. So it's just something having to do with them growing up. And, they're not there yet. Um, as you know, there are several religious schools and synagogues and neighbors who, much, who must walk in the street because we have very few sidewalks, fire danger safe, uh, and traffic safety. Um, if you approve this city, we feel the city will really be culpable if you approve this, if there are any accidents going forward. 
Um, the desire of millennials to rent is conceptual as well and is a ruse. Just the last few weeks, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times report that millennials are wanting homes now, not apartments, which is a huge threat to the rental market. Uh, we also oppose this density for senior living. I think we need a new battery here. Well, that's not what I wanted. Concealing. Um, what else is being concealed? The 200 and, um, what else is being concealed? Uh, why is PUD 63 units per acre? Um, why is this more dense than any of the other Wood Partners uh, projects, the Phoenix projects? All the other ones average about 25 units per acre. This is 63. We think we have the answer. The architect for this build is Mr. Pasternak. He never revealed during the East Camelback Village, nor the Planning Commission, and last week, that he is the sole owner of the R5 zone parcel, plus four of the 12 homes that are going to be destroyed. Mr. Ernstberger, who spoke before the Planning Commission in the November 1st uh, council meeting in support of the PUD, never revealed he owns one of the 12 homes. All these parties have a vested interest in the PUD, especially Pasternak as architect. What else is Wood Partners hiding? Why is such density ne necessary? Could it be the land is being purchased for far beyond the residential market value? That is why this density is necessary for it to pencil out. We know the homeowners are offered 50% or more over current home prices in this area. I do not know what Mr. Pasternak will be paid for his R5 acre and the four homes that total a second acre. In other words, he owns two acres out of 3.9 acres that we're talking about. Let's go further. I notice that Councilman Stark is not here. Michael Lieb is a broker for this development. Councilwoman Stark's chief of staff is the daughter of Michael Lieb, which creates the appearance of impropriety. You decide. I, I just can't get this to move. So, so I just want to say to you, um, Wood Partners is not true. They're not true to Phoenix. They just flipped their third PUD at 16th Street in Highland. That sale went through on November 6th. They're flipping. That's what they're, they're doing. They're making money, and then they're leaving. To the city council and mayor, I ask that you broker a compromise instead of breaking our neighborhood. Be sure you know the risk. Is, is satisfying the developers worth ruining the neighborhoods and worth angry neighbors who vote. Be careful how you vote. It's reasonable or is it recklessness? If you vote for this PUD, we believe it's recklessness. Please broker a compromise. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And as I stated earlier, I'm gonna be appearing telephonically for the mayor of the meeting. The vice mayor will lead the meeting now, please. So the neighbors have about 16, 17 minutes. On the cards, I am trying to get some clarity on them because I have uh, Larry Whitesell and I have Fred Selby up next. And then I think I go to these cards, which um, there are four cards being donated to Mary Crozier. I will also call in Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor, uh, excuse me, I'm Larry White. So we have gone out of order from what we originally planned based on Mr. Earl's presentation. So would we be allowed to just come to the microphone in the order in which we'd like to speak now and introduce ourselves? And we will respect the 16 additional minutes for sure. You have 17 minutes. Yes. How would you, how would you like the order to go? So I'm going to speak next. And your name is? Stacy Champion. Okay. And I'm Larry Whitesell. Larry, and then who else? And then Mary Crozier. Okay, because I have Fred. And then if we have time after that, okay. more people so will speak. You, you three will go, and then if you have time, got it. And I will be fast. Okay, thank you. Please go. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council members. My name is Stacy Champion. 
In rebounding from our last detrimental crash, it seems the city of Phoenix has not learned from its past mistakes of putting all its eggs in one basket and has simply replaced a two-headed monster for a three-headed monster. Though yes, density can be good, you must understand that established neighborhoods all across the city are comprised of residents. Do you want me to stop for a second? No. Okay. I'm also hoping that everyone can pay attention to what I'm speaking since I've been sitting here waiting. So, Got it. Uh, our residents need to be on more equal footing with the developers who currently appear to be running our city. Many of these are out-of-state developers with no vested interest in community outside of turning profit. The mishmash of PUDs across our city without both foresight and strong design standards is taking its toll. Residents across the city feel unheard and unappreciated, and many of these development projects are not reflective of our community values. Many of you sitting before us have personally reached out in the past and, and currently for our support. It's time for you to pay attention to us, those you're supposed to be serving. And know there are times like today where the right thing to do is to stand with your residents, not this developer. And two final things to add. Why do developers need to be pushed to this extreme to bring decent design and streetscaping to the table? And secondly, if this, in the attorney's words, ultra-sophisticated millennial-type complex is what they think that millennials really care about, I would just like to point out that they're not spending enough time with millennials. Thank you. Thank you. And I would ask for a no vote. Uh, Larry. Hello. <laughs> I'm Larry Whitesell. I'm the co-chair of the Peak Neighborhood Association. Thank you so much for your time uh, today for us to be able to address you once again. I do have a handout uh, for you. I may not get to everything that I had planned to say. Some of it is on the handout. Uh, there's an extension of what um, I presented at the last council meeting. In fact, many of my comments will be extensions of what you heard during the last um, council meeting. I first wanted to address uh, Councilwoman Stark's uh, comparison with the largest apartment complex in the state of Arizona, according to her, at 1,222 units. It's on uh, 7th Street and Greenway Parkway, which is actually on Paradise Lane. Uh, it's a little south of Greenway Parkway. Um, we, I have a slide, actually. Let's, I've changed the order. Let's go to the third slide, please. Here are some differences and some important factors about comparing, no, let's go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Compare, this is the complex uh, that, of which she spoke, the SEO apartments, and go to the next slide, slide please. She said that there, were, there was only access to 7th Street. She is correct, but there are two points of entry and exit on 7th Street. You can see this is the north uh, access point. 7th Street has a large median. It also has a dedicated left turn lane. Go to the next uh, slide, please. Here's the south entrance on 7th Street. It also has a median with a dedicated left turn lane. What she didn't know, I assume, is that there is also an exit only lane on the, on the far left of the slide. You can see coming down, it looks like it curves onto Paradise Lane, which it does. This is exit only, one way, and on the next slide, please, there is a no right turn sign, which means that the traffic is forced onto Paradise Lane, where there is a light, where they, I mean, yes, and away from the neighborhood, where there is a light, where traffic can easily make a left-hand turn with the light. So the differences between these two complexes or these two uh, locations is extremely different. I also want to point out on 1,222 units, it's also on 73.4 acres. That makes the, uh, the density 21.4 units per acre. That's very different than the um, Marlette project. And if we use the same ratio, the Marlette project would actually end up with, um, 20, with um, I can't find that in my notes. Uh, well, the Marlette project would be 63 if, uh, 
if it goes through. Um, I also want to point out the nearest school to the project uh, at uh, Paradise Lane and 7th is a mile point three away in the southwest uh, side of the of the community. There are sidewalks throughout the entire community. It's very different than the schools that are one block and three blocks away in a community that has few sidewalks. The conclusion here, ladies and gentlemen, is that the city must provide infrastructure for projects that require this kind of density. We have not provided that infrastructure and the Wood Partners will not compromise despite the lack of infrastructure. Also, I want to address uh, Councilwoman Williams' uh, statement about uh, her neighborhood or her district, which I found enlightening and, and very true. She said, I quote, we have um, so many areas in my district that have no sidewalks, and we have very few street lights because it was considered rural 40 years ago, and people didn't want, sight, uh, didn't want street lights. So thank you, Councilwoman Williams, for listening and complying with the neighbor's wishes not to include uh, street lights and sidewalks that would change the character of that rural neighborhood. We are asking the same consideration of you today to listen to the residents uh, comments that do not want this kind of density without having the proper infrastructure. I also want to mention uh, Mr. Earl's statements about property owners being asked and many of the dots on his uh, compliance map were business owners, not residents. People at 802, the Grunos, uh, on Maryland, 802 East Maryland, were not asked. They don't show up on his chart at all. They're right across the street. There's an issue with the, stati the um, statistics that he presents to you. So thank you very much. I strongly encourage no on this PUZ rezoning. Okay, is Mary Crozier, you have approximately six minutes. Wow, that's more than I thought I'd have. Well, um, Vice Mayor it's Pastor. because we, we, yeah. Vice Six Mayor minutes. Pastor and members <laughs> of the City Council, I'm Mary Crozier. Uh, thanks to the leadership of both Councilman Gallego and Nowakowski at the last meeting, Mr. Earl finally did agree to meet with us. It was a pleasant meeting. Uh, and like Mr. Uh, Nowakowski, we were hoping to find out more about this project. We went to his office and bottom line, it's uh, 245 units, period, end of discussion. And at that time, we did discover that Wood Partners has not spent one penny on doing any construction drawings, nothing, which I found quite shocking. So we have no detailed information on this enormous 287,000 plus square foot building on this very small parcel. So we know nothing about the nine foot man other than he's a nine foot man. Um, I called Mr. Earl again on Monday to discuss our suggestion, which is 170 units. Again, nothing. Has to be 245, or it can't be what he calls a class A luxury product. I said to myself, what? Wood Partners can't build a luxury apartment complex at less than double density? The fact is that all other Wood Partner projects in Arizona are class A luxury developments with far less units. And surprisingly, all built at the density we are proposing. At 170 units, that would be 43 units per acre, a 30% increase of what's currently allowed there now. Their other projects range from 38 to 47 units per acre on much, much larger parcels of five to seven acres. Building 170 units on such a small parcel is completely within their wheelhouse. Our compromise makes perfect sense. Mr. Earl stated earlier that this area is zoned for high density. That's not true, it's zoned for 15 plus. You know, what would also be in compliance? The city requires a minimum square footage of 250 feet per apartment. So somebody could build 1,150 apartments there and that would be, quote, in compliance. But doesn't that sound ridiculous? Using lu the luxury argument to defend doubling the density on this parcel is equally ludicrous. Just because someone pays more for the land and God only knows how they determine construction costs without any plans doesn't mean they're entitled to build what they want, disregarding the underlying zoning and negatively impacting the surrounding neighborhood. We look to you as the board of directors of our city. The facts don't support approving a conceptual PUD at double density 
in an area that has, he only showed a very small part of that neighborhood, no sidewalks, multiple schools, numerous churches, and a very large walking religious community. We know Wood Partners has millions upon millions of dollars, you know, good for them, and I know they hire lobbyists to influence your decisions as they can, and we know that zoning attorneys raise an awful lot of money for your campaigns. We know this puts the thumb on the scale in favor of the developer. But neighborhoods can't compete with that. We don't hire high-powered high attorneys, and we certainly don't have lobbyists. Actually, even this week, uh, one of Wood Partners' regional construction managers sent out an email to 60-plus subcontractors telling them to show up at today's meeting and support this and providing the false statement that our neighborhood doesn't support any new development, which is completely untrue. We actually have six big projects going on in this neighborhood that's all new development that was uh, done collaboratively with developers. But here's what we do have. We have neighborhood experience. We work, live, and play here, and we know this area is heavily traveled by both pedestrians and vehicles, and cut through traffic. We know where there are sidewalks and where there are none. Just as I don't know anything about the traffic patterns around Mr. Earl's home or the Scottsdale office of, of Wood Partners, they don't know the dangers of pulling out onto 7th Street with its suicide lanes. And spending one hour in August when none of the snowbirds are back and saying that is what the traffic is, that's, okay. You have one minute. All right. They don't know that little Leo, who testified at the last meeting, fears his personal safety biking uh, to school or to karate class. They don't know about the child who was struck by the car walking to school three weeks ago, but we do. Your decision today should not be made on who contributed to your campaign or who your friends are who has made promises to you behind closed doors. Your decision should be made on the facts of the case. This is a land use case, not a design guidelines case. The development of 245 units would put the nine foot man in our neighborhood and slapping some brick veneer on him will not make him suburban and blend in with the character of the neighborhood. Our compromise provides plenty of housing for millennials, provides plenty of patrons for the businesses and restaurants. It's responsible and reasonable option for both the developer, the neighborhood, and the city council. It provides additional revenues to our city. And Wood Partners has done this before. This is the same density they've done in nearly all their Arizona projects. Eight seconds. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we only have our passion, our voices, and our vote. We are asking you to make the right decision based on the facts. Please do not vote in favor of this PUD with all its unknowns and put our neighborhood's safety and character at risk. Thank the better, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. You have a teacher sitting up here. Uh, there has been a request uh, for, uh, what I'm going to do is give each side five more minutes. And what I mean it by that is, uh, uh, Mr. Earl would like to come up and speak about uh, some of the comments. I'm going to give you five minutes, and then I will give five minutes to the neighborhood, and then we'll move from we'll move to discussion. Vice Mayor, thank you uh, for this opportunity. <clears throat> I have listened carefully to everything that's been said today. Uh, and, there, and things that have been said in the past. Um, I want to correct a few things, uh, at least from our perspective. I know that you have two very different perspectives here tonight. Uh, but one perspective is saying, talking about a nine-foot man is not very helpful. Uh, we can all agree or, or, and graciously disagree. The simple fact is that this project is a three-story project at only 35 feet on, Mar on Mar Marlette. Saying it's four stories overall and putting that in petitions is not helpful. It is four stories, but it's not four stories on Marlette. It's four stories behind and everyone who surrounds it is in favor of it. We showed you last time photographs uh, that it will not go above the trees that are there today. No one in a single family home will be imposed on by this. We've heard a statistician stand up here and say he knows more than traffic engineers, both the private sector and the public sector which is a little bit hard for me to take because we hire professionals to study this traffic. 400 cars are not coming out of this garage at a peak hour. That's just silliness. What is coming out is a certain amount of people come out of this project at a peak hour. 
That was studied carefully. And all those people that come out during that peak hour can make that turn. And by the way, I, I really, it doesn't matter if that drone video was taken when I took it, when school was in session, or it's taken in the middle of December, or in the middle of February. The results will be the same. Because the traffic stops at, at, at Maryland. And there is a gap when, no matter how many cars are there, they're stopped. And when they're stopped to the south of us, there is an open gap. That's the thing we, if, if, if you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then that video ought to be worth 10,000 words. It shows that no matter what we think, that's what the reality is. There was a lot of things said about Wood Partners. You know, personal smears are not very helpful. The people who are, the, who are in charge of Wood Partners here have lived here combined more than 40 years. All of their people are local. Uh, and, and so it's not fair to talk about something far away. Uh, there was a fire concern raised. We show pictures of buildings on fire. For heaven's sakes, that's not helpful. The, this project will be sprinklered. There are controls over how you construct buildings. Their buildings are constructed all over the city every day. Uh, and, and so we have the fire lane, the proper fire lane. We'll have the proper water there. Our, our plan has been looked at and reviewed, and you heard last time that it passed muster with the fire department. Uh, and, and so we, we have adequate access all the way around it. There, there was a concern that we don't have construction drawings, and, and I appreciate that neighbors may not appreciate what the process is, but, but that comes down the road after you get through the zoning process. We put an enormous amount of effort into showing you exactly what this project will look like, both in the standards that we created and in the renderings that we created, and we're, good, we're willing to stipulate those renderings. So we really think that we've gone above and beyond what you would normally see in a PUD, and, and, and we've sat down with Alan, and, and I know that Alan has told people in the past that PUDs were a little bit amorphous, and so we tried to be very specific over the last five months to say, we will do these things. We'll put shalls in the document, and we've even agreed that we'll stipulate that we have to build according to these things. So that what you see and what you saw here tonight is what you'll get. Um, I just don't think the traffic is an issue, and I don't think pedestrian, there's any harm to pedestrians when we've shown you that those sidewalks exist all the way around the property. And we're putting in the final uh, missing puzzle piece. So we think this is an excellent project, and I have one minute, so let me talk about density. <laughs> we've been accused repeatedly of not dropping the density of this, and that somehow that, that would be the savior, that would be the silver bullet if we would take 70 units out of this project and have it be the same project. Well, we created a PUD which showed all the luxury elements of this project, including turning, facing it to Marlette and all the other things we've agreed to do and having no access. If you take 70 units out of it, you don't have a project anymore. The PUD is, is worthless. Uh, so. And, and by comparison to other projects, just so we're clear about this, notwithstanding the arithmetic information you got, this is not the highest density project. In fact, all the other projects that have internal garages are at a higher density per acre than this one. So it's just not fair to just throw information out there that's not accurate. We believe this is an outstanding project and will in fact create revitalization for the whole area and my lights turned red, so I'm done. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that was my, I, I now see that the timer's on. <laughs> I have my phone going, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure who's representing the neighbors. Okay, I'm gonna let the professional take the time. <laughs> I will address the traffic study, and I ask you just to look at the page that you put out there. They are projecting 38 left turns in the peak hour of the business day. Out of a car, out of out of a garage that holds 420 cars, that's absurd. That's nine percent of the cars in that garage. Are you telling me that only nine percent of the people are actually going to work in the morning? Doesn't make sense. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Okay, me. Good. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Earl's missing the point. We're not against development. This could be a lovely development but it could have been equally lovely development at an appropriate density. We're not attacking Wood Partners' character at all, uh, other than the fact that 
I've yet to go through a PUD, PUD where I've never met the developer. I personally have never sat down and talked to this developer, which is highly unusual. There's so many unknowns. Mr. Earl, nor can I, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict how many cars are going to be pulling out. We have to rely on logic. If 80% of people work between 6 and 9 a.m., guess what? That's when we're going to have the traffic. You can't say that that won't happen. And that's part of the problem with this project. There's so many unknowns and unpredictables that so negatively impact the surrounding neighborhood. I know everyone's put in a lot of hours, trust me, we're not getting paid to do any of this. And we've put in an enormous amount of hours. I personally have analyzed every single Wood Partners project in Arizona, every single one. The square footage, the, the uh, uh, acreage, the number of units, and this is the most dense one in all of Arizona, whether they have an internal garage or not. So this is an anomaly. This is a nine-foot man, and maybe it's not helpful to show that, but a picture does say a thousand words. One little item that I noticed, the fire lane that we saw on the east side of the project is only 15 feet wide. An appropriate fire lane has to be 20 feet wide. So where, where's the other 15 feet going to come from? And if we're planting these trees that are going to grow 30, 40 feet, as Mr. Earl says, how is that not going to allow a room for a fire truck, a uh, ladder truck to drive in? So there are risks, and what we're saying is we want development here, we want an apartment complex, we just don't think it's appropriate to double density in this suburban area. This is not the downtown code, this is not the high density incentive core, this is not the infill district. So why is this even being allowed? That's what we want to know. Thank you. Is anybody else? You have two minutes. You have two minutes, so. You want to come up to the mic? Do you have a, please state your name. David Wax. I'm a, ma I'm a neighbor on Maryland as well. And two things, I mean, there's a lot of orange shirts here. And these are all neighbors, uh, residents, and taxpayers, and voters who live within this community. And I'm just wondering where, if you'd please raise your hands, where the residents of the community that are for building this apartment complex and see the economic benefit from that two, three, and you live in the neighborhood? Okay, so there's three or four of you and then there's, you can count the orange shirts yourself. My wife and I moved to the community because we liked the feel, we liked the, the neighborhood, we liked the safety, and we liked the schools. What we didn't like was the traffic on Maryland and we live right on Maryland, but we dealt with it. We deal with cars barreling down Maryland, going through that uh, traffic ease uh, roundabout where they all blow their tire going 80 miles an hour. We had somebody that ended up on somebody else's lawn on New Year's Eve because they raced down that, that, uh, that roundabout and buckled into a building. The fact is that right now the traffic is so bad as is in the morning when I go to work and I own a business right down the way, when I go to work I have to put my blinker on out of my own uh, driveway and I have to wait there for a minute. So I can't imagine 7th Street being any better than Maryland. Maryland is a, a narrow street. Yes, there is one lane in either direction, but there's cars whizzing by, weaving in and out. And the last thing we need is something with multiple times the density as we have currently. I have a one-year-old son, and I'm afraid to take him out walking on the street some days because of that, because the traffic's so bad. It's like that old game of Frogger, if any of you are aware. So, you know, I don't want to take up any, but, you know, take up time for anybody else, but I just want to make, make it aware that there's all these people here in orange shirts and there's three residents that are for the project. Thank you very much. You guys have 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, great. I just want to make my voice heard. I live on 10th Street in Marlette. My granddaughter goes MTA. I deal with this traffic every day. I get on 7th Street in, Mar in Marlette. I take Marlette to 7th Street to come to work downtown and Traffic at 8 o'clock was backed up from 7th Street to Rose Lane, stopped at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I just You're want, this is so wrong for our neighborhood. I need I, your name, sir. Maurice Smirsch. Thank you. A lot. Yeah. Thank you. And now my phone won't stop. <laughs> All righty. So as the vice mayor, first time in this role, <laughs> uh, we have, do we took public comment and now we're moving to discussion. Are we taking a motion? 
I need some assistance. I have some questions. We're going to close the public comment and okay. then public hearing, and then we can move to the questions. Okay. So, Councilman Waring said I love the gavel, so this is my first time having the gavel, so there, we closed it. Now, Councilman Nowakowski has some questions. I have a question for Maurice, if you can come back up. They should all know who you are. I know, but I didn't okay. want to reveal that. <laughs> I'm incognito. He actually works um, downstairs with, um, when we park our vehicles takes and stuff. Care of he takes care of Oh, hi, Maurice. Hi. So I know that you come to work every day down 7th Street. Can you, we just looked at that presentation of the drone and all. Can you give us your perspective about that? About the drawing? About the drone and the um, traffic. Oh, the drones. Yeah, yeah I'm, I was kind of curious about that because, I, like you said, I drive downtown four days a week, and at 6 o'clock, it was kind of looked similar to what I see at 6 o'clock in the morning. I showed you a picture of uh, 7th Street and Rose Lane, how it was backed up, uh, traffic was stopped all the way from 7th Street and Bethany to Rose Lane. Um, you know, my daughter can't even walk to, my granddaughter can't even walk to school, and we literally live catty corner from MTA because the traffic on 10th Street is so bad. So there's a lot of things that are um, kind of hit, and it's almost like smoked mirrors here on the presentation, because I'm not an expert, but I live, I live here. I've lived here since 1964 in this neighborhood. I grew up on Citrus Way and 10th Street. You're taking a 3.9, acre parcel and you're cramming 70% density into that lot. And I thought we were also supposed to go green. This is so uncharacteristic of our neighborhood. You know, like everyone has said, we're not against redevelopment. We promote redevelopment, but it needs to be smart. And this is not smart. This is getting every buck you possibly can out of every square foot of property. And it's just not fair to the neighbors that have lived there most of their lives and put time and effort into the community. And uh, this is not gonna be good. So, um, like I said, there's a lot of smoke mirrors here. Um, I'm pleading for a no vote here. Thank you. And appreciate your time. And Mr. Earl, I have a question for Mr. Earl. Mr. Earl, I had a uh, a Woods partner um, project in my district just right off of Fillmore and 7th Avenue. We worked great with them. I know that safety was a top priority. I know that there were some concerns about the fire lane and, and being 15 feet or so. Can you kind of clear that up for us? Yes, I'd be happy to. Fire lane is what, Joe? 20. Yeah, the fire lane is 20. This fire department requires 20 for its fire lane. So. If it needs to be 21, we'll make it 21. But the fire lane is the width of the that is required by the city along the east side of the building. Um, and you know, again, we've reviewed this fire um, system and plan. Again, these will all be sprinklered units, so that that changes the the fire system. Okay. I, let me correct that. There's 28 feet from the edge of the east edge of the building to the property line. And so th that entire area would be open. And then, Mr. Earl, the other thing is um, when you're coming off of, um, coming out of that property, there seems like there's an alley there that you can actually cut through and go on to uh, Marlette. Is that, is that true or? No, it, it was true. Uh, that was an alley. That alley was abandoned uh, along with Stella. That alley will belong then to Christos, and he's going to turn it into his parking lot. Now, is there a way to not to allow cars to actually cut through? The only reason I say it was a cut through because I cut through there on Monday morning when I drove the property and, and just to make a, just to get to Marlette, there's actually that little, yes. it is, it's a pay valley. I, I fully understand that. It, it, it is passable today right. um, because that's because the abandonment has not been completed. You, you have right. to actually 
you know, complete all the stipulations and then pay the city the fair market value of that land. And then it'll be turned into the parking lot that will be solely for his use and he will have signs prohibiting through traffic and will take action against anyone who does. All right. And then That's what he's told us. Thank you. And then I have a question for Mr. Stevens or even our streets department. Some of the concerns that um, I heard from some of the residents right there on Marlette, you're going to actually have some of the um, apartments facing Marlette where people would be tempted to park their vehicles right on the street itself. Is there, in the future, if that becomes a problem, is there some type of no parking signs or is there something we can do to prohibit um, individuals from parking on the street and kind of using their parking structure? Yes, Vice Mayor, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, there is a, a process that you go through with the street transportation department to petition that area for uh, first would be no parking and then there's a further petition process uh, to make it resident only parking uh, that could be uh, gone through. And the other question would be um, Maryland um, Avenue. They were saying that it's kind of a mini um, freeway down there and that there is a, a roundabout that kind of slows cars down. But there's, is there anything else that we as the city of Phoenix could provide to ease the traffic down Maryland? Vice Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, um, we could talk to the street transportation department about studying, uh, you know, traffic along Maryland Avenue to look at traffic calming impacts. Uh, I believe it's a minor collector road, so it would not be eligible for speed humps because it collects larger traffic in the neighborhood, but there might be other, other avenues that we could look at. Uh, but at this time, there's been no study of that and uh, there's no money dedicated for that. And the um, whole process of a PUD, normally a PUD individuals don't, provi they don't provide us plans prior to the PD, PUD being approved, right? Vice Mayor uh, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, it would be extremely rare for any rezoning applicant to do full-blown construction drawings. You're talking about thousands of dollars to pay an architect or an engineer when they don't know what they're actually going to be able to build. So it is most common to have conceptual project renderings and then if you get the approval of the, the council to build that project, then you go into the actual architect and engineering design phase. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Is there a motion? You know, I, I have another question. I mean, okay. I really don't feel comfortable because I've worked with uh, Wood Partners um, just last year and we've created a great project right here in my district and we had meetings with the community. We sat down with the uh, neighbors and they worked things out and it's, it's kind of odd to sit here today hearing that the same individuals that I had the opportunity to work with really didn't sit down and, and really compromise or try to work things out with the community. I was hoping, knowing their reputation and my experience with, with partners, that they would have sat down and um, are, I'm not sure if there's miscommunication, but I wish that there was that Team Phoenix approach where people came together and worked it out. And I'm not sure if there's still an opportunity to do that or not, or if we need to, because I think it's gonna be, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful project. But I think that the community, the people that I've been talking to, they're saying that they love the project, but they just don't like the density, and they have some concerns about parking and, and maybe turning onto 7th Street. And I, it seems kind of minor st stuff, but I'm not really sure, you know, if it pencils out as, as a developer or not. But I was just wishing that this week that we had to work things out that we could have came closer to the center. It doesn't seem like we arrived to that. I was just going to ask Mr. Earl if you had more time. Is there a way to work these things out with the community? or? I'm, I'm just. Uh, Mayor Councilman um, Nowakowski, <clears throat> uh, the comment you heard from Mary um, and others that we did meet is accurate. Um, their characterization is that it was 245 or, or nothing. What we heard from them was 170. 
So it was a radical difference between where we were and where they were. And I was trying to point out that the project is kind of an integrated project. It's not like you could lop off a building because it's kind of all together. Um, I, I think their additional time would be helpful to work out stipulations that may be more acceptable. We can work out, uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's the potential for really studying um, Stella, for example. I mean, I'm happy to go out and do another drone study. I'm happy to go out there and sit there with all the neighbors and watch the traffic and actually use a stopwatch so we can all determine that. I'm happy to work on sidewalks so that they know that there is you know, going to be uh, adequate um, safety for kids. And maybe some additional time would help on those things because I'm absolutely, you know, would love to be able to bring resolution. Uh, at, at the end of the day, density to me is how does it impact? You know, is it too tall or is it going to produce too much traffic? So I'd, if it's a study of the traffic, we can work on that. If it's stipulations, we can work on that. If it's sidewalks, we can work on that. Um, I, th I think there's a bit of a false hope that if you take, let's say, now mind you, we've come from 270 to 245, but you take, let's say, 20 units more out. Well, the building would look the same, but it would have 20 less units in it. Uh, and then the question is, does, does that, that synergy work? So I'm not saying it, it's off the table, it can't be done. I think it's just really hard to do with the style of project that's been designed here, and that's, that's the whole PAD, uh, PUD. I mean, it's built around this project. So, uh, but there's lots of things we can work on in terms of stipulations and, and looking at the, the um, traffic on, on 7th at different times. I mean, obviously we're in a different time period now. The, um, you know, the snowbirds are back and maybe there is more traffic and maybe we can study the, again. I, I would just like to do these things empirically because I gave you my impression when I went out there, and my impression is different than theirs, but it's an impression. It's it, what I did on a particular day. That's why I think it's always better to actually <laughs> create a video and show everyone what it looks like. So. But the other thing I heard was like the height on Mary, Maryland. Maybe that might be something you all can sit down and maybe compromise and move it. I'm not sure, but I think just sitting down and having those types of conversation and trying to find that happy medium or that common ground and working from there. Because at this moment, I'm not really comfortable voting to approve this project because I think there's a lack of um, communication between the, <laughs> the community and the developer itself. So, Mr. So, Earl, I have some questions for you. Yes, ma'am. And my questions are, uh, why are you holding firm to this footprint with the number of planned units because I think where where the issue is is the number of units and I think what the for clarity purposes to know for also for the colleagues of mine is to know if there is any room to negotiate the number of units because I think that's really where the neighborhood is wanting to discuss um, and if the answer is no then I, I believe then all of us should go up for a vote because then it then then to buy more time is not going to help we're going to be back at this place a third time around and there could be possibly someone else asking for another continuance um, I doubt it but it's, it's now, is, is like in the business world, time is money. So um, that's my question to you. Well, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I don't want to repeat myself. Um, and so let, let me say that we tried to work on that issue. And, and uh, obviously, we've come to the 245 number. Um, the number I heard from the neighbors was 170 at the most. The project that we've designed cannot be built at 170 units because you can't pay for the elements of it and make it work either when you build it or over, over the long term as it's operating. You wouldn't have enough units to pay for the luxury nature of the project. So coming down that far just wouldn't work. Uh, now, is there a room between 100 and, I don't know who came on or left, uh, 
is a room between 170 and 245, there, there may. Uh, but, but we have to keep the integrity of the project in, in order to make it move forward. So uh, that's the best I can tell you on that. We can obviously, as I indicated to Councilman Nowakowski, we can work on lots of other things and we can try to make the density work. Um, so. Well, what I'm hearing is 170 is too low, 245 is the number. I am anticipating if Councilman or whoever wants to make a continuance, somewhere in between the 170 and the 245, there needs to be some negotiation. That's what I just, I'm repeating or interpreting what you said, uh, and I want to make sure I interpret it correctly. Let me ask my client. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandy, did you have anything to add? Would you mind coming to the microphone? Vice Mayor? I'm being told by my client that we can try to find a number between those two numbers. <laughs> I think for, is the neighborhood willing to, to do this? Because we have two sides. Oh. I'm sure, I'm sorry, what, what are we willing, or what is being offered? What, there's nothing being offered. What, what is, what is uh, happening is what I'm hearing, I don't want to, I don't want to continue this again, or there may be the votes for a continuance. What I am saying is this would be the second time for a continuance. If the neighborhood and the developer cannot come together, then maybe the possibility is we just need to vote for the item. What I asked was 170 is too low. I'm hearing 245 is too high. Can the collective come together and discuss what uh, the possibility could be. Between I don't know that it's that simple. Number of 170 and 245. I'm sorry, I don't know that it's that simple and the reason I'm saying that, I mean, okay. I, I, I think we need to, you know, all along we've said, first off, your um, the current zoning is 130 and the current zoning is at 50% density and the density is the issue here. Correct. So, we went up to 170, and again, we maintained the 50% density. So he can come down, you know, 10 or whatever. The, the question is, what is the density? We want three stories, we don't want four. This is a, a one to two story neighborhood. So coming down 10 was nothing. I mean, that, that commutes to three of his penthouses. That's nothing. So then the, the fourth story, I'm sorry, the fourth story is on that, the, the R5 section. And so, if they would come down and let it go across and... I don't know what they would come down to. The question is, are you guys willing... We'll uh, talk. ...to talk if there's another continuance? If not, then we can go for a vote. We're and, willing and, to talk. That's why we were at his office. So that's why we I called think that's him again. that's what Councilman Nowakowski is trying to figure out. I'm sorry. I know this Thank is you. a public meeting, but I have to be Thank right you. back. Thank you. Councilwoman and Vice Mayor? Yes. And just a moment. Is that Mayor Stanton? Yeah, it, it's Mayor Stanton. Look, uh, I've been on city council and a mayor for a long period of time. Um, it, it's always my experience that we don't negotiate from the dais. Uh, it sounds like th there was a, a willingness on both sides to give it another shot. I don't know how much time that would take, but this would hardly be the first time that we as a city have continued a case twice for, a, for a, a difficult zoning case. So I would certainly be in favor of that if we wanted to get, get the two sides uh, together. Uh, I would certainly be willing to personally uh, uh, get in the room. Uh, and so I'd be, I don't know how much, again, we have to figure out how much time it would need, but I'd be certainly be supportive of that as opposed to trying to negotiate it from the dais here. Wonderful. 
So it sounds like both sides are amenable to a continuance? So I'd like to well, make a motion to continue oh. this oh. that we can actually sit down and hold on for just a sec. Go ahead. Sure. I just want to make it clear that the zoning for this parcel right now, it's 130 units. Mr. Earl said 270. That was what they started with. That was long before they even had a conversation with us. Right now there are zero apartments on this lot. So they haven't come down at all. And we haven't gone up at all. There's really nothing there. The underlying zoning is 130. We went up 30% to 170, which to us was a compromise. It was a good effort of faith. And they're still at 245. I always agree that we should get in a room and sit down and roll up our sleeves and talk. But if this just is another exercise to tell the neighborhood, no, we're going to go to 242 or 240. I mean, I don't want to waste your time. T trust me, I've hardly seen my family. We've spent so much time on this. I want to hear from Mr. Earl and Wood Partners that they are serious about starting at what the underlying zoning is and going up from there, not starting at some ridiculous number like 270 and coming down. That's overinflated, bloated, and that is not even realistic. So if he can guarantee me, us, that they are really willing to come to the table, because right now this PUD is contingent on this zoning getting passed. They haven't purchased the land. And you know, if it's a fishing expedition, be honest and tell us. If they're really willing to talk to the neighborhood and it's 170 or 175 or something in those, that area, fine. We are more than happy. We've been begging to talk to them for months. So I just want to be honest. I don't want to get smoke and mirrored. I don't want to be wasting any more of my time personally. So let's hear from Mr. Earl. Want to hear from me now? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Obviously, we're coming at this issue from different positions. We keep hearing what the current zoning is, and we've done our calculations about what that number of units is under a PRD option. It's different than what Mary just indicated. I don't think it's uh, productive in this meeting to talk about arithmetic calculations. We can do that with the help of Alan Stevenson and his staff and come up with what could be done under current zoning and what couldn't be done. Uh, the current zoning, by the way, also allows the R5 to be used as an office. So that's part of this equation in terms of traffic. But our, our position has always been we want to have a beautiful project. And so we're proposing something that's truly outstanding and unique that we thought would be a real, real benefit. Now, can, if we sit down in a meeting, are, is our group going to come down to 170? Not with this project. It would have to be a completely different project, so the PUD that we, we have here wouldn't work because it has a whole number of luxury features in it. It's designed to not access all the things I've said. So we would be essentially starting over at that point. Now, can we negotiate between 170 and 245? Yes. But uh, if it's going to be, if what, what I'm hearing is, Mary is saying, we think we've come as far as we can go at the 170 and we don't want to play games with a few units, then it may not be a productive session. I, okay. So it's, I, obviously, okay. I want to solve this problem, and I, and I hoped it wouldn't be the council that had to you know, make that decision, but well, you know, we've tried very hard to, to make this project worthy of your support. Thank you. I think uh, we need a motion. I don't think you should ever negotiate on the fly. I mean, well, just, no, I'm not negotiating. Sloppy. I just wanted to know. Oh, no, I didn't mean okay. you did. I just said that this is where this is going. And you can't pin people down in meetings like this. It's not appropriate. Uh, I'm fine with the continuance. I get the drift of what's going on here. Um, I'd like to give it enough time. There are two issues that need to be discussed. Uh, one, the density, and two, the, uh, the traffic study. I like the idea of having the neighborhood there when they're doing the traffic study so that you could evaluate it, have the statistician there, you know, at least look at it that way, and then you can dispute the findings later. Um, I think that's a fair request to do that. I, you know, yes, well, I'd, I'd rather not at this point, sorry. And I'll second that. Yeah. Okay, so, there's a I, continuance. I, I, have, I have a question. Well, I, I need a date. Thou um, made, a, made a motion I've for a continuance. I've got a surgery thing going on the 29th, so I'd like to do it the week the next after. The one is December 13th. December 15th? 13th. 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 Well, I thought we had one December 5th. 
You oh. have a policy session, but not at the oh, wow. formal meeting. All right, till December 13th. That's my husband's I mean, I, birthday. I want to be here when the vote gets cast. It's my district. I, I have a question. Husky, second. Go ahead. We have had hours and hours yes. of testimony. Take it under advisement, then. And if you're going to bring it back, I want it limited that 10 minutes on each side, anything progress that has been made. If not, that's it. Well, one of the agree. things we, you know, I'd like to put in the motion, too, is that they in both sides have to be able to bring in new information focused on whatever negotiations had occurred in that period of time. That period of time gives them plenty of time also to work on a traffic study. I like it. I think it makes a lot of, it's logical to do that. I think it's fair. Uh, the two issues were traffic. Traffic was the predominant issue more than the density that I've heard today because that is the biggest issue that's been out there. And um, if the traffic study uh, and you have the neighborhood there looking at the traffic study, watching the process go through. So that's my motion, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Oh, Vice Mayor. Okay, I'll take that too. Uh, there's a, mo a motion and a second. We need a voice vote. Go ahead. All in favor? Say aye. aye. Sounds like that's a basketball. Sounds like a, that's where the mayor is coaching. <laughs> Was it a three pointer, Mayor? And perhaps we I got, could take. I, I got eight, uh, seven, eight year old girls waiting for me. Okay, so we asked for a continuance. There was a second. We did a vote, a voice vote. What is your vote? Aye. Okay, but, thank you. Vice Mayor, I'm also an aye. This is the end of Okay. Are there any opposed? There's no opposed. Thank you very much. Next, on to the next item, which Thank is... Thank you very much. And we could maybe try to take it right after the consent agenda so that anyone who has other things to do on the 13th can... Yes, and we'll be quick next time, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, next item is item 27. What's, move approval of item 27. Second. You got it. Uh, Diane Barker. Just a vote. In favor, Joanne Woods not to speak. In favor, is Diane Barker here? Okay. Let's go, Diane. We're going to start moving. <laughs> I mount their speak. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Pastor and City Council Diane Barker. Now, I'm in support of the DPI receiving near this uh, $4 million, which they're a subsidiary, actually, of the Downtown Phoenix Partnership. They do an awful lot to better the downtown area. And um, what I'm wanting is, is, and I've, Greta and some others have said that many times she didn't believe that they got good counsel information from the legal counsel in the past. And that was somebody that was not Brad Hall. In regards to this, when they publish a publish no, uh, meeting notice, they say they're not subject to open meetings. I've read case law for facility districts across the United States, and I have not seen, when I've asked the clerk or anything, where it shows that I am incorrect on the fact that they should be going by the open meeting law and it should be posted not with a boilerplate that they're not subject to that. And finally, Dan Glockney's been great and he said the public comes, you know, the public really it's a time that if they wanted to, they, their meetings aren't at that time. But the thing is, is when the public does come, we should feel a part of it there is 90% that comes from tax assessment on, uh, on buildings, but there is general fund money in this, and it should be more welcoming when public officials go there and the public may come that we are welcome there. Thank you. They do do a great job. Thank you. Uh, we do not have a quorum at this moment. Is, is somebody on the line? On the phone. Councilman Valenzuela, are you on the phone? Uh, Mayor Stanton, are you on the phone? But 
we will pause at this moment? I understand, but we'll take a recess. tonight item uh, 38 actually could we do item 38 39 45 46 and 47 sure move approval yeah actually I um, was wondering if we could make a motion um, we could actually divide some of those up there's an airport one I had a question on and I would actually like to motion that we continue items 38 and 39 So we're going to continue, we're, you're asking for, hold on, we're asking for items 38 and 39 to be continued? To be continued to our November 28th formal meeting. Okay, so. What, November 29th. Okay, November 29th. So item 38 and item 39 is to be continued. Uh, is there a second? I will second. Uh, Councilman uh, Williams, are you getting on the phone? No. All righty. So we don't have a quorum. Do we do? Oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> item, thir okay, I have item. Leonard Clark, could you please come to this podium for 38 and 39? Thank you. I think you were just continuing it, right, to November. So you're just continuing. I'll just wait till the next. Okay. Time. Thank you. All those in favor? No. Aye. Oh, no. <laughs> Three to two. Three to two. It, with, with, on a continuance, it passes. It passed. Three to two. Three to two. It continued. It passed. Correct. Come on now, Kowski. Let's do the right thing. Let's go. Item number 42. Item number 42. Is there a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? It's about the brownfields. Yes. I have a motion. I need a second. Second. Thank you. Um, Diane Barker. Yes. Okay, I do have a question. After reading this, you're applying for a grant, but until the grant comes in, you okay. can't buy the property. This is uh, for Brownfields, uh, you know, asking an application of the uh, EPA. That is a good idea. You know, when we built the light rail on 20 miles, there were 100 Brownfields. I don't know what we've done to clean that up, but. Uh, we went ahead and bought property without something like this. So I'd like to have staff get back to me on what happens in the medium time. Do you go into your own public money to pay for this uh, cleanup? Thank you, Diane. So this is an application for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields Assessment Grant. Um, roll call. De Cicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Waring. <laughs> Williams. She's good. 
Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton, are you on the line? Councilman Valesuela, are you on the line? Thank you. Passes. Passes 5 0. <laughs> Item number 45. Of approval. Is there a second? Item 45. It is the Artist Fabrication and Construction Oversight Contract for 16th Street and Bethany Home Road. Public Art Project. Okay. All right. Roll call. Yeah, we could possibly. I think. Uh, counts okay. All right. All right. We can put them all together. Are you okay? Yes. Okay. Oh. I'll do 45 and 46. I'd like to make a motion on item number 45 and 46. There's a second. I'll second. I'll Roll call. Cecilio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Waring. Williams. Pastor. Yes. <laughs> Move approval of item 47. Oh. oh. <laughs> so let me let me ask this question. Can I have a continuance with the rest of the items? I would like to continue 45 through 46. I mean, sorry. I'm Can I do looking. a motion to take an item out of order and do choice neighborhoods now? Would that I be don't it? know. Choice neighborhoods? You've already voted for this at committee. Yeah. Um, a vice mayor, a motion to take an item out of order and move 86 through 88. What's that? I need a second. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Why not? Any opposed? Okay. So we're moving them. I am on item 86. We moved item 86 up. 87 and 88. 87, 87 and 88, yes. Vice Mayor, Council, these are all zoning items. I can make a quick presentation for all three and you can take separate actions on all of them if you would like. Yeah, these are great items where the city is very committed to affordable housing, so I think we could. Sure. Okay, so I know there are people in the audience who waited on these items and so forth. I did not pull these specific items. I did pull some of the other items. I made it very clear I was pulling them for a roll call vote. I was gonna vote no, and I did, and I killed a couple of them. Um, it's not my fault people aren't here. That's, that's not my responsibility. Um, I don't want you guys to not vote on stuff because of this. I don't think that's respectful to the people who waited through a you know, four hour meeting. Um, I just simply wanna ask a question about 47, and I think that's, no, you don't have it up there. Is that the last thing besides these three? Well, we need to do 46, I mean 46, 86, 87, yeah, that's what I'm saying. 88, these, and right, then after three. that, we will go to 47. We have the rest up there. Okay, because they so, were pulled by citizens. Right. right. Okay. So that's the situation we're in. All right. If you lose somebody Thank else, you. it's not my responsibility. Thank you. Okay. It's, I don't know who's responsible for that, but okay. Um, here we go. Item 86, 87, 88, does anybody want a presentation? No. Okay. What is that? Vice, but you can hold up one hearing on all three items, 86, okay. 87, 88. we're gonna hold one hearing. Correct. Staff report. Staff report. Vice Mayor, members of council, I'll be quick on one public hearing. There are three items that are all related to a choice neighborhoods uh, grant that the city is, uh, housing department is applying for. Item 86 is a request to rezone the southwest corner of 20th Street and Roosevelt Street to walkable urban code T4.3EG. The Central City Village Planning Committee and the Planning Commission both, both voted unanimously to approve it. 
Item 87 is a request to rezone approximately 190 feet south of the southwest corner of 18th Street and Van Buren. Uh, this proposed zoning is walkable urban code T55 East Lake Garfield. Uh, it was also approved unanimously by the Central City Village Planning Committee and the Planning Commission. Item 88 is a request to rezone the southwest corner of 15th Street and Monroe uh, for this is also a walkable urban code T55. East Lake Gateway overlay area. The Central City Village Planning Committee recommended approval unanimously, as did the Planning Commission for this item as well. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Does anybody have any questions? All right. I'm going to open up a public hearing. Anybody here? I don't think I have any cards. Item. Items 86, 87, and 88. The hearings on all three. Right. I, I don't have any cards. There, there's okay. no, no opposition has cards. to this. It's closed. Goodbye. Okay. For approval. Move Can I move it. it? I have to move it as three different motions? No, no, no. Wall is one. Okay. Move 86. Uh, move 86. Second. Although, roll call. I would just add and adopt the related ordinance. And, and adopt, adopt the related ordinance. I move item 86 and adopt the related ordinance. 86. The CCO. Did we get a second? I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Waring. Pastor. Yes. Passes. Okay. Item 87. Need a motion. I uh, move approval based on the Planning Commission's approval and adopt the related ordinance. Right. I'll second that. Okay. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Waring. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Okay. Item 88. I move approval based on the Planning Commission's approval and adopt the related ordinance. Oh, yeah. We have Vice uh, Mayor. One, one issue we need to give you some advice on. On 88. <laughs> on, on 88. Have you declared 87 yet? Yes, I did. Yes. We're, okay. we're just so on, on 88. On item 88, uh, Vice Mayor, one of the council members has declared a conflict, so we'll lose a quorum on that basis. Who we has a conflict? Uh, Councilman so Nowakowski, as I understand, has declared a conflict on item. Yes. Uh -huh. Item 88. So, okay, so, can, so we don't have we don't, a quorum, um, so we can't consider that. Okay. Today. We'll so can to. we can do? Can we continue it? What are the rules? So. Can we try point, to get I just want to make sure for future things, I don't want to dispute too hard, but you still have to yeah. either vote for a continuance yes. or you end up canceling the meeting if you don't have a quorum, don't you? Can, can, I, ask no, go ahead. We just, can I ask that we just take a two minute recess so we can get figured out where we are with our quorum? I, can we just take that one last? Let's just keep moving forward through these other ones. Can we do that? Because we got a quorum here for everything else. Right. So can we keep moving? Um, Vice Mayor, I members, go. of, members of council, I gotta go I'm too. out of here. So I'm, I'm out soon. Okay. Vice Mayor, if I so can interject, can I we ask? can continue this item. Okay. We have a little bit of time on this one. We can continue that to 1129. You can't continue. You don't have a quorum. You don't have, there's no quorum. Yeah. So the quorum. If we I, leave, then you can do it. I'm going to ask for all the remaining items, which is, uh, we have, a, okay. I'm going to ask for item 47, 50, 52, 54, 74, 79, 80, 81, and 92 <laughs> to be continued. Uh, Hold on. To the next uh, formal meeting. November 29th. That's fine. Uh, do I have a second? Just to just give a moment of pause, is there anything that has to go today from our city manager? One minute. <laughs> I just, I just, people have given us their time. I want to be respectful of the people who are going today. And no, I, I think that's right, correct. But you're going to lose a quorum. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor, uh, we have we have a couple individuals here for 80 and 81. If we can take those out, I, I'll second your motion. 80 and 81. Those, those are the ones that. Uh, Okay, I don't. I, I would prefer 79, 80, and 81 to be continued, but if we want to take them, the I don't have the votes. So well, let's go forward with those. Then. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Let me get to the page. Item 79. Can I take 79, 80? I, I know. We're, we're, doing, we're doing 79, 80, and 81. Sorry. We didn't have some. As continuances? No, they want to be You're heard. Hearing. Yes. So item 79. 80 and 81. Three abandonments. You want them continued? That's what they're, they're, they're trying to figure out. You want them continued? Because you're the public, yes. Okay. Can I take a pause? I'm taking two a recess, recess right now. And I'm doing two minutes. And we just want to say thank you to the public who's come and sat through this meeting as well as our city staff. Okay, hold on. We can move. So what had happened is item 88 was the one that uh, Councilman Nowakowski has a conflict. We're going to do a roll call now. What's item, the item? I apologize. Item 88. Uh, that's zoning at the southwest corner of 15th Street and Monroe. This is part of our choice neighborhoods. Uh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I would like to make a motion to approve based on the Planning Commission's approval and adopt the related ordinance. Okay. Second. All those roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Um, Waring. Waring. Yes. Pastor. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Okay. We are now on items. Item passes 5 0. Okay. We are now on item 47. I'm sorry, Waring, but this is new. Item 47 is an artist contract for the Sky Harbor Airport Train Rental Car Center. I move approval. I'll second that. There's a second. There's a question. For staff. 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 Go ahead. So my question is, uh, this is a, you know, I vote against some of the things I don't think are necessary. This is actually a fence that is absolutely necessary for safety as well as decorative reasons. So we're trying to make a product that we would actually have to buy anyway look nice effectively. This is a practical application of art, I guess the way I put it. Is that a fair statement? Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, that is correct. Okay, I'm good. All right, roll call. The CCO. He left. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Waring. Yes. 
Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Passes five zero. Um, uh, we are now on item 50. Mayor, I'd like to continue on item number 50. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, item 50 is being requested to continue. Now we have to the next meeting. The 29th? The 29th. All in favor? The Councilman Waring has a question. Uh, Councilman Waring has a question. I, ha I have a quick question. So these are items that were pulled not by members but by residents, right? Correct. So theoretically, I, I don't know if people who pulled them are still here. They are, and they asked for it to be continued. Okay. That's why we're um, doing it. So. You know what? Okay. Go ahead. All right. Voice vote. All in favor say aye. Yes, there was a motion. There was a second. There was a voice vote. All in favor say aye. All in favor say yay. Yay. Aye. Sorry. Aye. Opposed? Any opposed? Okay. It carries. Are you opposed? I didn't hear you. Okay. All right. Do so we have to hear it now? Four. Okay. Four to one. It passes. Yes. It passes. Item 52. Mayor, are you on the phone? Yes. Okay. That's it's four to one, right? It's four to one to continue. Thank you. Sorry. Item 52. Move, move approval of item 52, Fire Protective Hoods, City of Tempe Cooperative Contract. I'll second that. Uh, voice vote. It's a roll call. Roll call. The CCO. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Waring. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. <coughs> yes. Passes 5 0. It passes 5 0. Thank you. Item number 54. Item 54 is the Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport Land Reuse Strategy. Move approval. I'll second that. And we have public comments. Uh, Diane Barker. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Pastor, and City Council. Um, I'm very interested in this. I think it's totally important on this land reuse for Phoenix Sky Harbor West. I heard the mayor say at a navigator uh, meeting that uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor is the biggest economic revenue producer in the state. And where I'm going with this, you've got goals. Of course, it's important to stabilize the neighborhood and to uh, create a sense of identity and then expand economic. But we need to look at mobility. This is right next to the railroad. We need to look, and particularly after this long hearing today, traffic was the number one thing we were talking about. We have more people that will be coming, living downtown, will be coming here this winter. We need to move people, move people rapidly. We need to look at innovation on the way that freight comes in. A lot of things are done through Amazon, Target, and Walmart. They, they, you need to look at them to be a part of this West expansion for innovative freight delivery, fast systems, use the interstate for bus rapid transit, and in the future have one of the fastest trains run through here. We need to get vision. Thank you. Thank you. I need uh, Nicolas Cortez. He here? Would you like to speak? I'm Nicolas Cortez. I live in the uh, Van Nuestro Barrio neighborhood. Uh, right in front of me, I see uh, children going to school, walking in the middle of the streets because there's no sidewalks. There's the city has resources that hasn't reached out to our community for decades. Uh, nothing but uh, negativity has been implanted into the families there. Uh, uh, we need to see some positive things happen there now because we've been there for quite a few years trying to make positive decisions while at the same time fighting against these things that have been coming into the community, trying to take over the neighborhood. 
displacing families. Uh, and uh, most of all, I, I hold all my community accountable because they're the ones that made this city great. They've been paying taxes there for uh, property taxes, all kind of taxes. Uh, they're very uh, accountable for all that. They're good people and they just want to see justice and mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Patricia Gurole. Is opposed. Vice Mayor Pastor and members of the council. The planning and the public engagement process has identified an appeal for the stakeholders to maintain the residential component and cultural amenities in the area. The final land reuse report lists three goals expand economic opportunity, strengthen and stabilize neighborhoods, create a sense of identity. Creating and supporting a vibrant live work environment for the area would demonstrate good faith for the residents and the displaced community that may want to come back. It would celebrate the spirit of an honorable and great people who contributed much to the city of Phoenix. The area characteristics should be recognized and enhanced, adding to the diversity and vitality of the city of Phoenix. Cultural heritage is what keeps us attached to our religion, our tradition, and our beliefs. It plays a very important role in one's life. And because Phoenix is a relatively new city compared to other large cities, meaningful efforts to preserve our limited heritage and our historic resources are especially important and worthy of consideration. In this land reuse document, as stated, it provides a very limited approach in preserving and memorializing the community assets. We feel it further diminishes and certainly fragments the comprehensive relevance of the existing barrios, the Sacred Heart Parish within the barrios and the neighborhoods on the Salt River Flood Plain. The stakeholders will continue to be absorbed in this process. And we have proposed what we feel to be a comprehensive master plan to be seriously considered, the Father Albert Braun Veterans Memorial District. That will preserve and memorialize and reconnect the history that has been constantly overlooked. Our heritage is still here. Our community is still here. Let's collectively put a voice back, if not for us, for our children and for those who succeed us. We can collectively revitalize the rich history of the area and recognize the struggles of the past. We think this initiative, the Father Albert Braun OFM Veterans Memorial District, is worthy and effective and are here to see that it continues to move forward. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Juan Gurule. Buenas noches. <laughs> Vice Mayor, uh, City Council members, um, my name is Juan Gurule, uh, and City Council members. On uh, November 1st, uh, the City of Phoenix Aviation Subcommittee unanimously approved amendments of the Father Albert Braun Veterans Memorial District to be added to the Land Reuse uh, Final Report Phase 1. And for those of you that are on the, on the uh, uh, subcommittee, some of you are not here, thank you for that. Okay? Uh, the Father Albert Braun Veterans Memorial District recognizes Father Albert Braun uh, the iconic World War I, World War II hero and developer of the Sacred Heart Parish, historic Mexican-American barrios, and neighborhoods on the Salt River floodplain. It proposes to strengthen and stabilize existing neighborhoods, create a sense of identity, change perceptions, and expand economic opportunities. The specific postulates and benefits of the Father Albert Braun Veterans Memorial are, one, it proposes to reassemble and revitalize the rich history of Sacred Heart Parish, Veteranos, veterans, and all barrios neighborhoods on the Salt River floodplain. It provides a comprehensive master plan for historical and cultural interaction for present residents, veterans, displaced residents, city of Phoenix, and future generations. By the way, I underscore future generations. This is a, a, a hub that needs for the displaced folks to come back and interact with the people that are becoming in the future. It creates a heritage forum of honor, a centerpiece to illuminate the contributions of veterans especially Arizona Congressional Medal of Honor recipients like Silvestre Herrera, Jose Francisco Jimenez, and Oscar Austin. It provides connectivity from the historic barrios, Sacred Heart Parish, veterans, neighborhoods on the Salt River floodplain to the downtown area, uh, Sky Harbor Airport. It creates a public realm of a 200-seat children's education, performing arts theater, auditorium, retail marketplace, marketplace bike, walking paths, 
It creates a new economic stimulus engine. The Unified Arizona Veterans Organization, a consortium of 55 veteran service organizations, submitted a letter of support for this initiative on September of 2017. In summary, in summary, we request that the Phoenix City Council formally vote to approve the amendments to the, to the attached Father Albert Braun Veterans Memorial District proposal, land reuse final report, appendix I, phase one. Thank you very much, and I do have Thank you. this uh, to hand out to you, please. Thank you. Thank you uh, Vice Mayor, may I make a quick comment? Um, the community came up with a heritage trail concept that talks about the wonderful history, including the amazing veterans from the area who served. And we've been meeting with both the aviation director and the arts department to make sure that as we go forward that we honor that. Um, our planning department director has also been looking at ways to incorporate the heritage uh, trail in this particular concept. So a lot of work is, is moving forward to honor the amazing history of this area and our uh, public arts folks have some work that will be coming out soon based on oral interviews as well in the area that we'll be publishing. Uh, today the council voted on an art project that uh, is meant to also celebrate Santa Rita Hall with the Santa Rita Cactus as well. So we are moving forward with the Heritage Trail and we really thank the community yeah, leaders who have... Also? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, but we have been working to, tr to spread the idea throughout the city, so... We have to. Thank you very much. Thank Mary. you. Yes. Uh, Carlos Avila. Thank you, Vice uh, Mayor and Council, which uh, we have just limited tonight. Uh, thank you, and again, I just want to reiterate uh, the proposal that was presented by the Nuestro Barrio uh, Unidos Neighborhood Association. I'm here tonight in representation from them. Um, at the subcommittee on November 1st, a proposal was actually submitted for, uh, for the land reuse, and we want to make sure we recognize that as part of the submittal. Uh, also, too, I want to may also bring an attention. What we see tonight and what these proposals are have been the best interest for the city. Only the land itself. It's not being recognized for the best interest of this community that has endured for the past 17 years the impacts of this program. As you all are aware, sound mitigation has been a, a, a process that was given to impacts of homes in this community. At the time of this program in the bars, uh, that was volunteer program, allocations of money that was soundproofed was moved over to the program, which was a, should have been administered to these people, uh, the residents. That was taken away. How many millions of dollars is the city going to spend to finally recognize that the community itself still exists and over 300 to 400 homes of resident people still live there? This proposal that's being presented tonight and is to pass through the AFAA only looks at the best interest of the land for the aviation, not the community. The community is still has been waiting for the best interest for what the impacts have been through this program. The VARS programs which you have been administered with these lots have shown that they don't benefit the interests of this community now that they have shown to be commercialized. There has been, again, so much money that is spent, and we like to see the city take initiative to, to spend some money for this community that's still there. Thank you. Uh, Abe Arvizu, Jr. In favor? Mayor, Vice Mayor, and uh, Council and staff. Uh, as you've seen, we've, we've been down this road very, <laughs> quite a bit, and I just want to make sure that, that when you vote tonight, you're voting in favor of this because we need to move it forward to the FAA. We need to get a decision from the FAA of what are they going to allow, what are they going to work with us, and which direction we can go. That way we can come back to the community, the rest of us, in phase, in, in phase two, and then sit down with the decision from the FAA. So I hope that 
that you vote in favor of this tonight so we can move it forward and we can finally get going and quit stalling and, and move forward. 20 plus meetings, uh, hours in and hours out. And I want you to make sure you understand that there is a boundary here. And some of the presentations that were included in here are outside of those boundaries because they're just conceptual. So I hope you take that also and remember that and take that into consideration for uh, later proposals and later dates. Uh, so uh, I would leave you with that and hope that uh, you, um, if you have any questions, I'd be willing to answer them. But I, I think we, uh, at subcommittee, we talked quite a bit about most of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there, there's a motion and a second on this? Thank you. And I just want to thank the community members. This one's had a, a several continuances, several interruptions, over 20 meetings, um, 1,500 flyers, 400 door hangers. There's a lot of work to get us here today, and I'm glad that it's moving forward. Thank you to the steering committee members and the staff who have gotten us here today. Obviously, we are just getting started with this work, but a lot of people have put real passion into this project. So it's a uh, roll call? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Valenzuela. <laughs> Valenzuela. Okay. Waring. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Mayor Stanton. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Thank you. That item passes. Uh, item 74. Sure. So we had a vote earlier where it was four to one and two items failed. I think it was uh, 45 and 46. So I am the prevailing side. If you wanted to bring those back at a later date, is the prevailing side the people who weren't here too, who didn't vote, or am I the sole prevailing side? It, typically that's determined. Vice Mayor, Councilman Waring, typically that's determined by the people who are here and voted. So you're the prevailing vote. I'd be the vote. only one, that's so correct. otherwise it's just dead, and that's it. Yes. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, you have seven days to reconsider, but we can't, because those, ordinance, those matters involved in ordinance, we can't reconsider tonight. I understand. We have to wait 24 hours. I understand, but there, that question was already kind of asked. Um, I just wanted to anticipate a question that's likely going to be asked. Um, yes, it is. So. I'll ponder that answer. Thank Please you. Please ponder. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know who's on the phone. Daniel Valenzuela. brother. And? A quick stand. Okay, thank you. Um, item 74. I have a card on 74. Uh, Gail Palmer. Is 74 part of? Isn't it? Um, no, I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm waiting to hear. What, what would you like me to do? They're the same cards. Mr. Palmer, are you here for 74, 79, 80, and 81, all four of those, sir? Yes. All four together, sir? Uh, but I need more than two minutes. Okay, that's fine. Ready? Uh -huh. Thank you all for listening to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm against this proposal. Uh, there's several reasons, but Vice I Mayor, keep I'm hearing sorry. over and over and over. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm not clear which motions are on the floor. Do we have a motion for all four items, or, or do we have just a motion on I item? I have a motion on item 74. We have no motion. We have a motion on item motion. 74. Would you allow us to do all of them? 74, yes. 74, 79, 80, and 81. Mr. Palmer, if we provide you with more time. I need more time. I, would you like, I will give you more time if we can okay. put them all together. Yes. Okay. I need a motion for 74, 79, 80, and 81. You need a motion for 79, Vice Mayor? No, I need a motion for 74, 79, 80, and 81. 
And you're taking them all collectively, correct? Yes, that's what we're trying to do. M motion to approve. Is there a second? One second. Um, there's a second. Mm -hmm. Well, what are we going to do? I'd like to make a motion to continue these items until our next uh, council meeting. So a substitute motion made substitute to, continue motion to continue to November 29th. To November 29th. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion to continue. Are you okay, Mr. Palmer? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. And opposed? Okay, got it. Are you opposed? It's, it's being continued. Continuance? Yes. There is a continuance. And the other two. Yeah. This were the one that I wanted to continue originally, but. <laughs> so it passes. Six. Six. Six zero? Thank you. So item number 92. Hold on, I have some cards. Uh, is there a motion for item 92? Right. Is that it? Is that it? I'm asking for one. I move that uh, we reject the citizens petition and ask the Public Safety Committee to continue to study the appropriate roles for oversight of the Police Department. I move that we reject the petition and request that the Public Safety Subcommittee continue to study the appropriate governance for the Police Department. I'll second that. There was a second by the Mayor. Okay, there's a substitute to reject the petition. Is there a second? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Go ahead. What happens if I vote no? Vice Mayor, members of the council, the petition does not require five votes. Um, there has to be a quorum that votes on it, but it does not require five votes to take action. Um, if the the motion that uh, Vice that uh, Councilwoman Gallego made carried four to one, then we would proceed on that basis. Yes. I guess now I have questions. Are you ready for questions? You made a motion and you've got a second. There's a second. Nobody seconded no, mine, seconded. So, so we're good now for okay. questions from us. Okay, right. thank you. Um, thank you. Sorry, this has been a little ragged. So I know, it has been. I, what, what you guys it, are doing. it has been. So, not judging, just saying. So, no. um, my question is this. So this would not add, this would, this would keep this wouldn't stop anything that's already being done, Councilman Gallego's motion, Councilperson Gallego's motion, and it would not add anything either. It would so just continue. The intent of my motion is the Citizens Police Trust Initiative made some recommendations. Our Assistant City Manager has been looking at these issues. These are very serious issues to me, and I think we ought to have a robust debate that a citizen's petition is not the right tool to change this, so it would continue to allow the Assistant City Manager to do the work he is already doing. A no vote would do what? So it would still pass, but let's say the no vote prevailed, that would, but that would not end what the Public Safety Subcommittee is already doing, correct? I'm just, if it, if it passed. 
if my motion passed, which it's not going to, obviously. Is that, is that true? Right. Vice Mayor, is that, and uh, Councilman Waring, as I understand it, that's true. Okay. Um, all right, so really the effect of me voting no on this would be nothing, it wouldn't change anything as a practical matter. Correct. Okay. Vice Mayor, um, Councilman Waring, I right. believe that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have citizen cards, uh, Joanne Scott Woods. Uh, good evening, Mayor and, Mayor and City Council. Uh, on September 12th, the City Council denied Leonard Clark's petition to create a civilian review board, saying staff was already researching it through the CPTI. Then the City Manager, Ed Zucker, deferred to the Mayor uh, and his decision not to pursue the CPTI recommendation further. A few of us met with uh, City Manager Zucker and Assistant City Manager Milt Dahoney, and they confirmed that the CPTI was in sunset and no panel of citizens would be convened. The second p petition I promised, I was <laughs> to myself, uh, I proposed that not only a panel be composed of citizen volunteers, but also could be composed of an equal number of the Phoenix Police Department community relations officers. Today, the staff again recommends denying this, any citizen review petition, adding that further discussion by staff is possible. And I just heard uh, from uh, Councilwoman Gallego, that uh, it was inappropriate to have a citizen petition on a civilian review board. Um, the message again reiterated that only staff is capable of making decisions as to a civilian review board. Though this example of citizen suppression I have learned that the voice raised over three years of citizen volunteers can be silenced in a single direction of the mayor. I hope there will be no crisis in 2020, such as that of Remain Brisbane in 2014, followed by a third task force to solve the problem of police brutality. I had hoped that Thank in you, 2020, Joanne. Uh, time has ended. But now myself and others are basically hoping that the staff follows through by 2020. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Waring's laughing at me. I'm doubting right now my leadership role. Uh, uh, Leonard Clark. Um, hello, Mayor. Well, Acting Vice Mayor, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I find it a rather cavalier and regal attitude that says citizens in the southwestern state of Arizona, a state that is known for its progressivism and was founded upon those principles, states that the citizens, it's not appropriate for citizens to have a petition. Now this is an attitude that smacks of eastern politics and countries back in Europe where they don't even have written constitutions. If our forefathers and foremothers, thank you, of the city of Phoenix who first founded this city felt that the citizens weren't capable that we were children to be patronized and be told that we have the citizens police trust initiative. Uh, if they had felt that you know we couldn't be trusted to have uh, petitions then they would not have written it into the charter. Now I know the lawyers will get into it and say well that's not what they meant that's what they meant but you know I am not going to let this turn into we're against the police, and it's those activists, the police are against the activists. No, no, no. You get no, no excuse for this one. You are the captains of the ship of Phoenix. There, you may think and laugh at the fact that 10 to 15 percent of the citizens at least are cynical about the trust they have in our police. I find that a tragedy because I don't hate the police. In fact, there are police that put their lives on the line. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot have the police policing the police. When that honest police officer wants to come to you or go somewhere in the city with the problem, he or she won't be able to do it because they're going to be called a snitch. And our county attorney, who's already come out and said the police did everything just great at the Trump hate rally, well, we already know where he's at. So I must tell you, even though I know this is a bipartisan 
counsel for a Democrat to state in a neoliberal cavalier way that this is not appropriate for citizens. We are not children to be trifled with. This is a democratic body. And Arizona, last time I checked, uh, had a state constitution, again, founded on those principles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonard. Sean Severud. Vice Mayor and members of council, uh, per the staff analysis of the previous August 30th, 27 citizen petition regarding the Police Oversight Review Board, the city manager uh, then stated that they uh, had supposedly charged the assistant city manager to conduct research over the summer of 2017 with the intent of facilitating a discussion in the fall. Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's now the fall and uh, there was no outcome of that. So now apparently, I haven't been in these meetings, but apparently now we're claiming that that is in sunset. Um, so there's a reason that these citizen petitions keep coming up. Um, it's because nothing ever happens. So again, uh, I'm asked that you support this uh, citizen petition uh, because apparently that's the only way that we can keep uh, the, the wheels going here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martha Winkler and Diane Barker are in favor, but chose not to speak. Are you, Martha, are you wanting to speak? My name is Martha Winkler. Thank you. On 7 14 I was horrifically assaulted by a Phoenix police officer, Jason Gillespie. I called for service to file a police report of what, what I thought was a wrongdoing at a Circle K in Central Phoenix at a Circle K. I'd done absolutely nothing to provoke his rage and this that this officer inflicted upon me. He had barely attempted to talk to me about why I had called and requested police help. I, I was the one that had called the police for him to help me, not to beat me literally half to death. He quickly escalated the situation and slammed me to the ground head first and beat me and caused life-threatening injuries. He then immediately handcuffed me while unconscious. I could have been dead, dying, or paralyzed while I was unconscious and handcuffed. I was taken by ambulance to the hospital and had six fractures to my skull, an acute subdural hematoma, brain hemorrhaging, traumatic brain injury, extreme injury to my eyes, and extreme retina damage, extreme jaw and head injuries. I have acute hearing loss, head pain, and sleep disorder due to this extreme injury. I suffered a mental breakdown because I couldn't work and because my injuries became depression, anxiety, and PTSD. I couldn't understand how this could happen to me. A middle-aged white woman, a new grandmother, living in North Central Phoenix who went to the Circle K to buy lottery tickets because I felt lucky. In the hospital for four days, two days in ICU, my 26,000 hospital bills was paid under the crime victim funding. The hospital considered me a crime victim. I was on morphine and oxycodone for several months. My medical bills have topped $100,000. I am now on disability. Nothing has been done to Jason Gillespie. Per, per Sergeant Tad Klein, it went up and down the chain of command, and there was nothing found to be unbelievably wrongdoing, and nothing would be done. Jason Gillespie stated in his report that I fell. No person simply falls and maintains these types of horrific injuries. They charged me with the crime of trespassing to cover up the incident. I went to the Arizona Republic, and they did my story. My civil case against the city of Phoenix and Jason Gillespie is ongoing and, and they have been fighting for us for over three years. Six months after the assault, they wouldn't even release the police report and only then, and only after we filed the notice of claim, they wouldn't give us the 911 calls that I had made. They have tried to get my case dismissed repeatedly, say so they don't have to pay for my injuries, although they will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayer dollars fighting not to pay me. 
The Phoenix police many times escalate a situation instead of calming or de-escalating it. And in situations like mine, end up injuring, shooting, or killing someone who had called the police for help and are inadequately trained in communication with citizens and psychology. I was and am horrifically injured over this, over nothing, after calling the police for help, and I will never be the same. There was absolutely no reason for such violence upon me. In fact, there was no reason for violence or force at all. I am a woman who is always very safety conscious, a kind and gentle person who was unbelievably, horrifically injured with absolutely no provocation, no justification, and there's been no ramifications to criminally charge or fire Jason Gillespie. This type of thing doesn't just happen to black people, it happens to middle-aged white grandmothers too. They think they can get away with this, and they usually do. I was an unarmed woman, absolutely no threat. I called the police for help. Any regular citizen who would have done this to someone else would have been charged with aggravated assault and or attempted murder and then been in prison for 10 years. This is exactly why we need a citizen review board. When you have the police investigating police, this is what the outcome will be. And I have documents for you. Thank you. Mayor. I'd like this distributor to everybody on the council and the mayor. I will like a, I go ahead. Um, and is there a way for us to get a full report of what actually happened in Vice Mayor Council Nolkowski, yes, we'll give you a full report. Thank you. Uh, Diane Barker, I have you as in favor, but not wanting to speak. All right. Is there a vote? We're up to a vote now. Ready? Uh, who's on the phone still? I'm on the phone. I'm the phone. And the mayor? Daniel Valenzuela. Okay. All right. Here we go. What, um, what is the motion again? I'm sorry. Motion. Uh, to <laughs> reject the petition and ask the Assistant City Manager and Public Safety Committee to continue reviewing the important issue. All right, that's the motion. Are we all ready to vote? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Uh, permission to explain my vote? So, uh, as was discussed earlier, if it wasn't clear, um, the motion that looks like it's got some prospect of passing because it doesn't, it doesn't even need, right, Brad, it doesn't even need five votes. It needs a majority, which it's already got. Uh, you know, realistically, I don't know what the Public Safety Committee is going to do. I'm not on the Public Safety Committee. And uh, this isn't in any way me ratifying what they do because that's an unknowable because it hasn't happened yet. So uh, really what this is saying is we're going to reject the citizen petition and continue doing, not me personally, but, but the council members on the Public Safety Committee are going to continue to investigate as they've been investigating, and then they will bring forth recommendations and we will have a separate, I assume, vote on that at some point. I'm not on the Public Safety Committee, so for me it won't be until it gets to the full council. That is an accurate statement, right, Brad? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I will vote yes to reject the citizen petition. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Passes 6-0. Thank you. Um, now we move on to uh, citizen comments. And um, I don't know. Yes, how? Is she here? Please state your name. Uh, my name is Fang Ho. Uh, I was for uh, reading the letter of the Chinese uh, uh, Culture Center designer. Uh, so, dear mayor and uh, vice mayor, uh, councilman and uh, councilwoman, I designed the Chinese Culture Center with some classic architecture elements 
such as red columns, lattice railings, diamond-shaped windows, and the royal glazed roof tiles, the same as what used in Forbidden City. When designing the classic roof lines with the royal gla glazed tiles, green edge and the rich uh, tiles, and the cone tiles, and the, the figurines of sea fairies and uh, beasts. Perfection was achieved to ensure its quality will last hundreds of years. The building style combines the best of the Western and the traditional Chinese architecture with the garden of harmony in its foreground the two complement and echo each other, making them an inseparable whole. Even though it covers only a small piece of land, it successfully gives you a taste of entire classic Chinese architecture and the cultural elements. Looking back, uh, the Chinese uh, culture center is truly the result of collective wisdom and the hard work of so many people, both in China and in the United States. It would be a complete insult, not only to the ethnic Chinese Americans, but also to the, all the people in Phoenix and the, the state of Arizona, if it, this culture icon is to be removed from its, this site. I appeal to all those in the position of power to work to preserve it. Do not become the one who will be remembered to have destroyed culture and the history for our future generation to see and experience. Ye Ju Hua, September 1st, 2017. Thank you. Your name again? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm thank reading you. the uh, designer. Thank you, thank you. Um, Mayor Stanton, are you still on the phone? Okay. Councilman Valenzuela, yes, are you I still am. on the phone? Yes. Okay. Sean uh, Severu, he was just here. Okay, he's not here. Leonard Clark. Thank you. Well, I'm so sorry that sometimes citizens say things that you might not like. And I understand from your position that you have to sit up there also and listen to things. Uh, I actually believe that hate is a divisive thing. And so I, of course, I, I don't hate, and I don't hate you. Uh, do I get frustrated like you do? Yes. Um, I'm simply somebody trying to you know, stop our society, the divisions that are occurring right now in Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the United States of America, I with others who are Republican, Democrat, all of that really doesn't matter. It matters how we get along in our neighborhoods. We want to feel safe. We want to feel protected. And right now, we have a lot of artificial walls built up in this city. And, you know, I just think it's time. Things are askew. There's too many lobbyists, too much money coming in, you know, to the politicians, and I think the people get left behind. So, you know, you might, I probably shouldn't say it because you might do it in this age of shrinking democracy, of a shrinking constitutional democratic republic. Um, I hope, you know, that you don't take away, I mean, why have a citizen's petition if you're going to, you know, say that basically citizens just aren't equipped to present petitions? I mean, that's what our charter has you know, in it. I'm concerned because yesterday, you know, there was an officer, it was in the news, who smashed out the teeth of an 18-year-old young man, and I believe wrongfully, even in fairness to the police chief at the time, the top brass, they said, no, that's going too far. It made other officers look bad. Yet that individual is back on the police force because of a five-member five civilian review board. And then yesterday, I don't know what you did in your executive session, but, you know, you talked about this individual, and what I've been told is when it goes to risk management, it was presented as a court case that generally individuals, when they sue the city, are asking for back pay. 
So I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping, and I have nothing against this individual. And by the way, go to abc15.com. There's an officer who needs help who is in a severe car crash. I cry for that officer in my heart. But allow another officer to come back and then pay back pay. I'm not sure if that's what you did in your executive committee. That just sends out the message that wrongs the police can police themselves, and they can't. And it's not fair to the police. You're the politicians, and you need to stand up and take a stand. So uh, I hope that we can build up trust again. I'm concerned about the use of drones. I heard in our subcommittee, public safety, that police, m the majority of the Arizona anti-terrorism, and I'm, I mean, I'm not saying it's totally bad, they compromise the terrorism Homeland Security Board here in Phoenix and in the state of Arizona. And that is not privileged or classified information. That's public. But that concerns me because there's a wall of separation between the federal government and the state and the city. I don't want to find out that officers that are on this anti-terrorism board are using drones to spy on their own people. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Williamson? No. Daisy Champion? Vice Mayor, Council, I will make this quick because I am hungry and grumpy and want to go home. Phoenix is in the bullseye of climate change. Our city continues to get hotter every year and this affects everyone, but especially our most vulnerable. Sadly, the citizens of the city don't see the majority of our elected leaders at any level taking this issue seriously enough. This was felt deeply on the morning of November 11th when a shady oasis was destroyed in the heart of downtown and the city was caught unaware and unable to stop it. This cannot be how City Hall is allowed to operate. And I would like to say thank you to the staff who was trying to figure out what was going on on their days off and also to Councilwoman Gallego, who I know brought it up at the policy meeting uh, this week. So the City Council established the Tree and Shade Master Plan seven years ago. It strives to address our inadequate tree cover and lack of shade. Unfortunately, the City Council hasn't been striving to implement it. In light of recent events and City Hall's foot dragging, the citizens of Phoenix will therefore lead where our Council has failed us and begin to fulfill the promises of the Tree and Shade Master Plan. Led by Roe Green and the Urban Phoenix Project, we will create and assemble a Citizens Shade and Tree Committee as described in Council's Tree and Shade Master Plan, something that Council has failed to do. As further described in Council's Tree and Shade Master Plan, this committee will then draft the ordinances and text amendments required to preserve and grow Phoenix's tree canopy, another thing that Council has failed to do. Media and city staff will be invited and encouraged to attend the committee's meetings. The Citizen Shade and Tree Committee will deliver their work to the Council early next year and will expect timely adoption so that Phoenix can finally begin its long overdue journey to combating the oppressive heat that is upon us. We hope that this work will provide the momentum for City Council to then finally begin implementing the promises that they made to us citizens seven years ago in the Shade and Tree Master Plan because seven years later we're tired of waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Scott Woods. Okay, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm here to um, request an, uh, another civilian petition to be considered for the study of the official renaming of Broadway Road to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Within two months of acceptance of this petition, it is requested that Councilwoman Kate Gallego and Councilman Michael Norkowski, who spearheaded the effort for the ceremonial renaming of Broadway Road to Martin Luther King Boulevard, will begin a study on the feasibility of changing it officially, including its funding and consideration for reconciliatory compensation for property and business owners. In 2015, on January 19th, it was reported that the original name of Broadway Road will officially remain and King's name will be posted at signalized intersections along the entire east-west length of Phoenix. 
Writing on phoenixsoul.com, Tremaine Jasper encouraged, quote, people throughout the Valley of the Sun to be mindful of the fact that the work is not done regarding the naming of MLK Boulevard. Furthermore, in a separate article, Michael Kelly of the Maricopa Community College's African American Advisory Council said, quote, the ultimate goal is to make the name Broadway a thing of the past, survey the businesses and residents here to determine if they want to name the street officially. Now in 2017, on June 28th, in an effort to become more inclusive, the City Council voted, to, quote, to amend its renaming policy so they could remove controversial titles without the support of 70% or more of property owners as the city's general policy requires. Mayor Greg Stanton stated, we want to send a message about our values of the city. That means Phoenix should not have public streets which demean our residents. State Representative Reginald Boulding praised city leaders for listening to the demands to remove the street names that are designed to tear our community apart. Despite its efforts to support diversity and promote reconciliation, Phoenix, quote, is still one of the few cities in the United States without a major thoroughfare named after King. And as its renaming has stopped short of becoming official, the South Valley Phoenician uh, stated that at, to this petitioner, the delay could be perceived by most as demeaning. Choosing to move forward now in 2017 will serve as a reflection of our city's growing commitment toward inclusiveness and as a call to, quote, all cities from Buckeye to Mesa to be embraced a permanent change. Hopefully in the next two years, this study will include the cost of funding as a future item for adoption in the 2019-2020 city budget and the transformation will begin. Thank you, Joanne. Appreciate it. That's the last of our citizen comments. Thank you for uh, following us and the meeting is adjourned. My